I wanted to tell you what happened to me when I first learned this method and how it saved my life. Great. So I'm at home and I'm making dinner. I think I was trying to get ready to go to a keto, so I'm kind of rushing. And the phone rings, as it often does, and I answer it. And the person says, hello, is this Gary Reese? Yeah, I'm coming to kill you. Oh, nice. I, I said, why? They said, you know what you did. So it was a case of mistaken identity. Somebody with my last name had beaten up their brother in a drug deal. Oh, so he said, I'm coming right now. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to leave. He said, you have no idea how close I am to your house. You can't get out. And I said, I'll protect myself. He said, not with the weapons we're bringing. And I said, I'll call the police. He said, I know exactly how far away the police are. You live out in the country, man. You're like a dead duck. So I thought, well, this looks pretty bad. Maybe I should try that new stuff I learned. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with process-oriented psychology expert, Gary Reese. A big thank you to our premier sponsors, Bioptimizers, Paleo Valley, and Organifi. We could not produce this podcast without their support. And of course, Paul only works with companies whose products he loves. All the sponsors offer special discounts for our listeners. So please visit the show notes page at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast for links and details. Or just keep listening to this episode for the featured product and offers. Today, Paul and Gary are talking about conflict resolution. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, our topic is a very important one, conflict resolution. Wow. We have conflicts in families. We've got conflicts inside of ourselves, and we've got conflicts all over the world. And today, I have a world-class conflict resolution expert, Gary Reese, here to help us understand how to deal with conflict and conflict resolution. And Gary, I've known for a long time, and I also have known his amazing wife, Sage, who's an excellent psychologist. And Gary is a psychologist, as Penny said in the intro. And uh, Gary also has a course he's going to be releasing soon on conflict resolution. So if you like what we talk about today, Guess what? You can get lots more time with Gary and master conflict resolution and change your life for the better. So, Gary, welcome. It's great to have you. Oh, Paul, thank you so much. It's great to be here. And such an important topic for the world. It sure as hell is. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm excited you got a course coming out on this. I think uh, that's probably one of the most important courses for all of us to uh, get into because COVID certainly... Uh, ran a rototiller right through the family unit. And I've talked to, as you can imagine, with 63,000 students through the Czech Institute, I'm in contact with a lot of people and, and many people's families have not recovered from the trauma of COVID and the you know divisions. And uh, there's just still a lot of brokenness in inside of people and in families. So Hopefully, a lot of our discussion today can help people work on these things. To begin with, Gary, could you give us some background on your life, your education, and what led you to engaging conflict resolution as an important part of your work? Sure. First, more formally, Paul, my education, I did a bachelor's in psychology and in political science at Washington University in St. Louis, and that was back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then after that, I trained in process-oriented psychology with Arnold Mandel, the founder of that, and got what's called a diploma in that. That was like a European degree, which was sort of the equivalent of a PhD. Then in, at about the age of 50, I went back and did get my PhD. I went to Union University, and I got a PhD in process-oriented psychology and conflict resolution as an interdisciplinary study. And so that's been, and then of course, I've been training in all kinds of different kinds of family systems work and many, many different approaches. And we'll talk later, I've been studying Aikido for about 18 years and integrating that. So a lot of different formal things. More informally, you mentioned my wife, wonderful wife, Sage Emery. And uh, I have a daughter, a stepson, two grandchildren that I love visiting and I have, I live in Hawaii and in Oregon. In both places, I have a strong hobby of doing organic 
organic gardening and farming, the place I'm living on now is a small avocado farm. So we have, it's that season where the avocados are literally raining from the trees and I love working. Cool. So, and I love snorkeling and I'm a runner, still run, run a little bit competitively. And um, so I have a lot of, um, a lot of different interests and passions in life. And of course, world work and healing the planet is my greatest passion. Fantastic. You know, you've mentioned process psychology. It's, it's not a commonly known branch of psychology. I'm familiar with it because I've studied, I don't know, probably all of Mendel's public, published books. And I love Arnold Mendel's mind. And I know, you know, Jason, my longest running client, Jason Picard, and one of my, probably my best friend is, is, has studied process psychology as well. And he loves it and shares it with me. Could you just share with us what process psychology is and how much of your approach to conflict resolution is based on price process psychology? Sure. I mean, most of my approach is based on process oriented psychology. And I have to tell you a funny story of how I met Arnie Mendel. Okay. So I, I, I had been trained at the Gestalt Institute of Canada and I was young and I opened my practice and I had this woman who in the middle of sessions would lay down on the floor and tell me a dream and go into yoga posture spontaneously. And they never trained us in Gestalt how to deal with that. So I was at the health food store and I saw a flyer on the board that says, do your clients in the middle of telling a dream lay on the floor and go into yoga postures? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, if so, you need to go hear Arnold Mandel. So that was about 40 something years ago and we just connected instantly. I went up to him right afterwards and, um, so I've been his student and a teacher of that work now about 40 years. And what does process work do? Well, you know, Arnold was one of the most popular Jungian analysts in Zurich. And he both, he himself felt that just sitting all the time, he started having body symptoms. And he really felt that Jung wanted to take dream work if he had lived longer, especially into the body. So the early process work was finding the dreaming process in the body, what Mendel called the dream body. And then he said, well, if we can find it in the body, we can find dreaming in relationship. We can find it in families. And I've helped develop a lot of the process-oriented family therapy. We can find it in people with comas. And I've helped develop a lot of that work along with Amy Mendel and Arnold Mendel. Um, we can find it in inner work and meditation. And that was, we can find it in movement and art and creativity. So process work, you know, before that, it's like you had to go to an art therapist, a movement therapist, a body worker. Process work was like, let's train our people in all of it. Let's make a holistic approach for the whole person. And so there were two other big developments in process work, Paul. The second development was the development of world work. And that's where Mendel really sort of made a huge leap from the Jungian model at the time. And that was the idea that we can work with groups with a dreaming process, all kinds of groups. And world work was leadership development, conflict resolution, and organizational development. So that took us for about 35 or 40 years. And then about 10 years ago, Arnold Naimi Mandel decided that people still suffer too much with body symptoms and relationship problems. So they develop what, what is called the second training. The second training is the more shamanic, intuitive, deep feeling approach to process work. And so in the 12 step program I'm teaching, we do all these different methods of working with conflict, first training, second training. It's all integrated now into a very, very powerful method. And it is true. It is very unknown in the U.S., except like when I'm teaching in Japan or especially in Warsaw, in Poland, in England, in many, many countries, in Russia, in the Ukraine. Process work is very well known. It's just been a little quiet in the U.S. Yeah, it's funny because I couldn't get my system of education to go in the United States either. I had to go to Australia and New Zealand, and it just went crazy over there. So I spent five years constantly going all over Australia and New Zealand and only when it got famous over there and the Americans realized they were way behind, did they start coming to me and complaining that I was teaching the competition. I said, shit, I spent years trying to, I went broke 
trying to teach you guys and you guys were so full of yourselves. You thought you knew everything. So now that you're interested, maybe it's time to pay attention. <laughs> I think that's, that's a similar story. There's big centers all over the world and, and it is in the United States. It's just, um, and we're all making more of an effort to bring it to the U.S. I think a lot of us teachers got really excited with taking it into the world. And now, you know, we're also very focused on bringing it in the U.S. I have a quick side question for you. Sure. Have you ever correlated people's astrological sign, their birth sign, with a myth and found that if they're disconnected from the myth or a key myth that's playing out in their life, that it's anchoring itself in the body, producing symptoms. I don't, you know, I mean, like Sage and other folks of mine specialize more in astrology. It's not exactly my path, but that is the whole key to process work is the idea that we have a mythical body. We have many bodies. And so our, our key work in process work, we work a lot with our first or our childhood dream. Paul, and we say in that childhood dream or a big repetitive dream or the earliest memory, that lays out our life myth. And Mendel used to be able to say we should be able to listen to the childhood dream and talk about not only the myth, but how that myth is being lived out. Like what, what body symptoms the person has, what spiritual path they're probably walking, what relationship issues they have. And it's still one of my most powerful tools. If I have a very short time to work with somebody, for example, um, with a body symptom or like I'm in a country and I go to a hospital or somebody has a very severe body symptom, I go right to that childhood dream. And by working on that mythical aspect, we unlock what's the process behind the symptom. And also locked in that childhood dream is the solutions we need for all of our problems. So you, you, you hit it exactly. It's a mythical journey. That's what process work works with, the life myth. What do you do with people that, that don't have a childhood dream? Well, almost then we'll work with the earliest childhood memory and use that like a dreamlike experience. Or almost everybody has had one really big dream in life. Um, and I've, I've experimented with all kinds of things. Years ago, I don't know if you ever knew Elliot Cowan, who was the guy who developed plant spirit medicine. Not not particularly. He's an interesting guy. He wrote that book, and he was one of the first white people in the U.S. to be given a huicha lineage. He was a very interesting man. And we worked together. Like he was integrating. He was originally trained as an acupuncturist. So we were integrating in our seminar childhood dream work with Chinese medicine concepts around the emotional body. And so there's a lot of depth there that you're really tapping into, Paul, when you when you bring those things up. Yeah, well, that, you know, those are the things that I'm always looking at in my work with patients, and I've been studying myth for many years, and I know that I've recently been restudying the Greek mythological heroes. I'm using a deck that produced by a guy named Latao Wong that I just interviewed. It's a Oracle of Mythic Heroes, and it's got forty. 40 myths and they correlate to your birth sign as well. Wow. And when I looked mine up, wow. I was shocked. It's uh, how accurate it was for my whole life. But I've observed that when people lose touch with the, with the core essence of the roots of the psyche and myth, it seems to create disturbances in themselves because they can't seem to move that energy through themselves either into the earth to ground it or out into the world to manifest. And so they end up kind of vibrating and, you know, it can produce a lot of neurotic symptoms. It can produce illnesses and diseases and body pains. And so I've just been having my mind reblown. You know, it was kind of like when I first started studying Joseph Campbell, I was like the fireworks were going off in my <laughs> head repeatedly. Yes. And now I'm reading all these Greek myths and, you know, looking at Hercules and, you know, all the different myths and, and how they relate to key character aspects and qualities and, vir you know, and virtues and vices. And I, it just has made me so clear that we've lost touch with our mythological roots. And I think because these myths are so embedded in our psyche, it's almost as though you get 
soul loss, really. You, you could classify it as soul loss because there's a part of you that you need to be able to breathe and to move through life and to understand the fabric of, of life and human relationships and human experience. But paradoxically, we've come to a point in our culture where most people think the word myth means a lie. So they've kind of ignored myth altogether. And the scientific materialist paradigm has done, done no good in that regard, you know? Yes, absolutely. The process work, the mythical level is so important. And, you know, you're, you're really talking process work theory. You know, when we get into more talk about organizations, for example, one of the key ideas in organizational work is that you can tell the amount of distance an organization is from its core myth, from its deepest essence, by the amount of trouble in that organization. So one of the key steps of the 12 steps with organizations is to put them back in touch with not only their deepest vision, but the deepest feelings connected to those visions. So whether you're working with a body symptom or an organizational problem, um, or something like that, you, you hit it on the nose. And the more we can tie in astrology, Greek mythology, anything that helps you to fill out and understand your myth. We do also, I do a lot of um, art projects on working with that myth and making it an alive journey. Yes, I, I have my patients. First, I guide them to creating their own personal myth and then I have them encapsulated in a mandala. There you go. And, and when they finish the mandala, it's very common for them to have quite a powerful emotional experience because something aligns inside of their psyche. And it's as though for the first time they've come to realize who they are. That's right. You know, Mendel also is a quantum physicist, and that's a lot of where he comes from. And so he uses that physics term, quantum physics. He says there's a pilot wave that moves us through life. There's a, a core wave and that we need to stay connected to that wave. And so your work sounds great. You know, you, you, you jarred a memory. One of the first things Mendel ever told my first wife and I in our couple sessions, he said, you guys are having a lot of conflict. He said, do you have enough pictures of mandalas up on the walls in your house? Because he said it will help you during conflict. Isn't that amazing? I just yeah. remember that. that was 40 something years ago. You just jarred that. Yeah, well, you know, because the center of the mandala is the representation of the self. There you go. And, and, you know, I've been teaching mandala workshops and having them in my training program for years. And I always tell people if you're having a hard time starting a mandala, make the circle, put a dot in the center, and then just start drawing from the inside, from the center out. And don't think too much. You don't want to think. Just allow your soul to express itself. Even if you don't understand why you're painting or drawing what you're painting or drawing, that will become clear later. And I'll help you see into it using my skills as an art therapist. And it always just completely blows people's minds what comes out of them. And when I interpret it for them, you know, it's often very tearful. <laughs> it's so exciting. We do such similar work. I mean, one of the things I do in in the childhood dream work drawings is we'll have people draw the dream as if it's moving onward. And then what have I, that's Mendel's work. What I've added to it is, is I have people go into deep meditation and then draw two or three frames out of meditation, like in Zen calligraphy. And then, uh. we, right. So we put together the more conscious drawing, the more unconscious drawing. And then we put that all together into a, a mythical drawing. It's just, it's so exciting because I don't know many other people who are doing that level of work with life myths. So it's great to, great to be connecting again. Yeah. You know, I, I've studied Jung's collected works for God, probably almost 30 years. And, you know, he's really the pioneer of art therapy. And I studied many different systems of art therapy because I, I found that I had so many patients that could not express what was really going on inside of them. That's right. I found especially people with heart problems and, and people who have what I call an encapsulated ego where they're, they're so uh, domineering and controlling that if they really look into themselves, they have to face parts of themselves that there's usually a fearful, broken child in there. So they compensate by that by becoming very outwardly directed and, and extroverted and controlling but when you try to 
you know, look into childhood, look into pain, get an analysis on these people, they're often very blocked or, or they're afraid or don't want to talk about these things because they're afraid to come into contact with the pain. So I found by using art, I could get, I can, you know, I always say the ego can never hide from art. <laughs> so. There you go. There you go. You know, in, in the early process work, we talked about different channels of working. And so most therapy, including most Jungian work, is in the verbal channel. Jungian work then goes visual, visual channel. A lot of art people are very visual, but other people, you can reach them through other channels. That's why we add on the movement channel. We add on the feeling, the proprioceptive body channel. We add on the relationship channel. Then we add on the spirit channel. Um, and then we add on the world channel, the bigger. But so when you have all those different channels, like you say, you can find that place where you may not be blocked, right? Like I have a lot of people who are very blocked verbally, but they can express incredible things in movement, right? Or in art. Art's so important to personal growth, all kinds. Or maybe they can't use, they can't use li linear words, but they're great with poetry. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's uh, that's not so common in our culture to be right brain capable. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how many, say it. That's how we say got it. a bunch of we got a bunch of people locked in the vault of the left brain, which is really a dangerous place to have to live. But uh, what are some of the other kinds of conflict situations that you work with, and maybe you can share about your work with the Ukraine and other areas of war, current and past? Sure. Well, also, we got so excited about that topic. A good lead in there is I never really said how I got involved in the conflict work I do. Yes. Yeah, and, go ahead. Okay. And so, I mean, first of all, the world work is just part of process work. And so, you know, together as a group, we would every two or three years lead world work seminars all over the world where we would work with whatever issues are present, all the big social issues. And... Um, so that was a great introduction to world work and being part of that world work, train, world work team. Where I really made a personal breakthrough was in Israel. I had been called to Israel, you know, in Israel being a general is a very high ranked position. And one of the general's sons was in a coma. And I don't know if he contacted Mendel and then Mendel contacted me or somehow, somehow I'm in Israel working on this young man. It's really hard work. I was working on him on my feet six, seven hours a day of body work and all the ways we work with coma patients. And um, I decided to go to the beach, take a break. And a woman called me and she said, I need you tonight to come facilitate Israeli-Palestinian conflict work. And I said, really? I'm going to the beach. And she said, well, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she said, what beach are you going to? And I told her. And I'm out there swimming, and all of a sudden I see this woman swimming up to me in a dress. And, <laughs> and she, said, she said, I called you, and I said, look, if you're willing to swim out in your dress, just tell me where to show up. And so I showed up in Haifa in the center, and there were Palestinians and Israelis there, and I began facilitating. And I've been doing that off and on there for about 30 years. I was just there about a month before the war broke out. I was in Palestine doing trauma training. The second thing that happened in Israel was when I was really young, I saw a poster for some mystic that was going to lead us on vision quests, individual. And he put me back in the archaeological region. He put my head up against the old temple walls. And I was a young guy and he said, just ask for what you want. So I kept saying, I need help for my marriage. It's a mess. And I kept saying, come on, give me help. And I couldn't get anything except you're meant to do something about the wars between the world's religions. Oh, well, that's a big request. That's a big request, especially when you're meditating next to the Jewish, one of the Muslim and the Christian holiest sites and the Greek Orthodox within about a five minute radius. And I was like, I can't do anything about the conflict between the world's religions. Like, tell me what to do about my marriage, you know? And uh, he said, uh, your marriage, that'll work out or it won't, but here's what you're meant to do. And so I had this incredible calling and I told this mystic who put me there and he said, okay, that's your work. So that was sort of the initial calling that has kept empowering me to do this work. And at this point, I think I've done this work now in about 16 countries like Israel, Palestine, Hungary, Poland, Germany, England, Japan, 
Thailand, Croatia, Holland, Belgium, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, Singapore, and we're heading this year also, I think, back to many of those countries, but to uh, Kenya. And then next year, we're doing an initial thing for Rwanda this year. So we'll be working in Rwanda. So we're taking this kind of conflict work everywhere because unprocessed conflict and historical trauma is everywhere on this planet. Well, speaking of personal relationships, how can you transform personal relationships in which there is too much fighting going on? And it sounds to me like you're, this is your first wife that you were talking about, right? Not Sage? Right, my first wife, right. It sounds like, you know, and brings up a point. Sometimes resolving the conflict is is realizing that you, you've just completed your time together and, and that you each need something else. So isn't there, isn't there also a time to just realize it's time to move on? Well, there's a synchronicity. My first wife is actually a really dear friend of me and, and of Sage's and is visiting. And her and Sage are off running to somewhere in Hawaii today to give me this quiet to do this. And so, <laughs> That's interesting. So one of the things I really believe also, and I know you, I'm sure you believe that too, is you can harvest in relationship the part that works. Maybe you fulfilled one part, but an ecological view for me of relationship is like, let's say you, you could be best friends or you could be family or you could be working partners. So I really believe in, in salvaging that. It, right. It's not like you're supposed to fix every conflict and stay together. You're following nature in process. Mm -hmm. Nature moves you on. When you talk about what to do with so much conflict in relationship, first of all, there's no training for most people on how to work with conflict, right? We've often said in process work, you should start training in kindergarten, especially with what you see in the schools, right? So we have all these different tools that we've developed on how to train people. For example, Mendel used to say, put this in your shoe because you're going to need it. The three steps method of conflict work sounds really simple. Take your side as fully as you can with emotion and really stand. Then take the other side, really not just say what the other side is saying, but really feel and dream into that other side. And then when you do that, take that neutral position. So that was the early conflict work. That sounds easy, but it's amazing how many people can't stand for themselves. Or, for, or, or are, are not willing to stand in the other side because they don't want to actually be adult enough to take the other perspective. That's it. It's usually when I ask in the room about half people can't take their side, half the people won't take the other side. And then there's always, it's always, you can say, we'll just take a neutral position. But when you're doing that in a really intense personal conflict to have suddenly a Zen mind and be able to study what's going on. So that method is really powerful. And I'll give examples later, but um, that can really transform conflict in couples really quickly if they'll adopt that model. That model is actually identical to an ancient Christian practice called the mandorla. Are you familiar with that? I'm not, but I know when the Mendels taught this to the Haida nation, the native nation, they said, oh, that's what we've been doing for centuries. So I believe it, that it's an archetypal method. Yeah, around, if I remember right from my studies, around 13 in Christianity, between 11 and 1300, you see the mandorla, which is the vesica Pisces, the two circles that overlap one third. So you have a side, a side, and then the, the uh, vagina shaped middle. So the practice is you label one side positive, one side negative, and then the middle is the neutral. That's it. So you list all the things that are negative about a situation or what's going on in your life, all the things that are positive, you connect deeply to each of them. And then you go through the middle and try to find out where it is that they're neither good nor bad, but simply wow. are. Beautiful. So that's an inner work method uh, that is the model for this outer work method. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, then the other, the other two methods that were just mind boggling for me and really helped transform my relationship with Sage. One is called four phase work. That's the newest conflict work. And what that is, is like a fluid moving and an awareness of the four phases. So the first phase is just avoid the conflict if you can, which is really interesting because when I trained in martial arts, martial arts, my teachers always said the first 
defense and martial artists try to get away from the conflict, like escape, run, mm. <laughs> do whatever you can. <laughs> well, my, my instructors never taught me that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you don't have to fight, don't fight. So the second phase is fight. Get in there and really conflict. Really take your side and fight like heck. When you get tired of that, or it starts to destroy something, your well-being or the relationship or your group or whatever, you shift to phase three. Phase three is like take the other side, but it's even more than that. It's that I have to find where my opponent is in me or needs to be in me. Okay, so now I'm really walking in their shoes, but I'm also asking myself, and really that's the biggest work that I do in my relationship with Sage. I often say I do it in the shower. If we've had a conflict and I leave and I'm like so phase two, like I'm so right. God, <laughs> I can't believe how right I am and how messed up she is or whatever. And then while I'm in the shower, I think, okay, now it's phase three. Where are you exactly like that? Or where do you need that energy that she represents in your life? So that, that will transform so many conflicts. And if that doesn't transform it, then we do phase four. Phase four is super detachment work, where I'm merging with the earth because the earth itself is non-conflictual, like the forest and the leaves and the soil don't conflict. So I, sh I become that earth and I move like that. I shape shift. And from the standpoint of the earth, I can work on the conflict. And if that's not enough, I imagine I'm going up through the clouds. I go into the heavens and I look down from the heavens on the conflict or I let the earth begin to move me, the universe. And that movement altered state, I work on the conflict from there or I get a tip. Now, phase four work, I've seen work where almost nothing else works. And so if we give couples the three, we give them the four, and then I could go on. There's a little, there, one. I guess one last thing, because it'll build in our discussion is X and U work. Oh, yes. I've, I've practiced that in Arnold Mendel's books. That's quite fun. X and U work is awesome. So what does that mean? Well, we used to say, Paul, that we marry our opposites, but in process work, we don't marry our opposites we marry the person who carries most of the energy that we don't want to have. So we call, we call that our X energy. So I'm my U energy. And let's say if I'm involved with Sage, she's my, she carries my X energy. I carry her X energy. So we have flipped screens. Her U energy is my X energy. My X energy is her U energy. And so when you begin to put those together, the way you do it is you go to the earth and you go into an altered state and then you move one energy and then the other until they get fluid. Now, I've seen that transform so many impossible conflicts quickly. Um, <laughs> it's funny, when, when I first learned that from, from Arnie Mandel, Sage and I got invited out to dinner. And this was a very important person in Eugene who wanted to talk to us about funding many of our nonprofit projects. So we were super motivated. And we had a wonderful dinner and we go home and it's Friday night. We're both exhausted. And that's the worst time to get in a conflict is when you're tired, right? You throw away all your tools. And so I said, Sage, wasn't that a great dinner? And she said, not really. And I said, why? She said, well, I didn't get a word in edgewise. You and him just talk, talk, talk. It was men, men, men. I said, really? Because my experience was you and him talk, talk, talk. I couldn't get a word in edgewise. And was, <laughs> right? There's the X and the U meeting each other. <laughs> they met each other. So we're in this huge fight. And it's like, we're so tired. And you know, those escalation fights. Well, you never, and well, you always, and maybe we should just throw in the towel and we're going like, we're freaking out. And all of a sudden I said, let's try that new X and U work that we just learned. And so I made the X of me, you know, and then her, yeah, you know, and she did like the me, her and the me. And then we both went to an earth spot and we're letting that alter us. And I move my energy and hers and they begin to flow and she moves her energy and mine and they begin to flow. And we open our eyes and we look at each other and we both start dancing and start telling each other how much we love each other. Well, that's a great way to go. And I thought, this stuff, this is strong medicine. Yeah. It's, re it's strong medicine. 
it's got a shamanic edge to it as well, which I like. It's the second training, so it's shamanic, and it uses the earth and its implicit wholeness to put us back together enough to flow between polarities. Hello, my fellow spiritual warriors and world workers. I hope you're enjoying this podcast as much as I am. It is no secret that today we are not only bombarded with so-called health and fitness information from every angle, be it social media, TV, podcasts, etc., but clearly it's not working. Many studies conducted worldwide show that children, teens, adults, and the elderly are the most unhealthy, overweight, and the sickest they've ever been. But it does not have to be that way for you. When I wrote my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, I researched the number of diet books available at that time, and there were over 5,000 of them, each claiming to have the right diet for anyone and everyone. But the reason I wrote How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy was because these books all overlook the fact that no two people are the same, and therefore no two people are likely to get good results on the same diet. That's simply fact. Another reason the myriad of diet approaches available today fail so often is that they don't look at the underlying causes that lead to body health and mental emotional challenges. They treat the human being as though it were a machine and all you need to do is add this liquid or that supplement and presto, the machine runs again. These issues are more important than ever considering the physiological, mental, emotional, environmental stress and toxicity in the world today. Today, it is critical to learn the essentials of how to eat, hydrate, breathe, cultivate life force energy, and use your mind to create the life you've always wanted to live. This is exactly what you will learn in our upcoming Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 1 training program, live with my wife and master instructor, Angie Check, May 31st through June the 2nd, 2024. This workshop is designed for anyone that genuinely wants to be healthy and is ideal for fitness enthusiasts, athletes, and parents. It's also a great chance to explore and see if you want to move into our Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 2, which is our professional level training, and pursue a career as a Holistic Lifestyle Coach today when it is so desperately needed. Not only will you be taught by Angie Check, one of the most knowledgeable experts in holistic health in the world, I will make guest appearances and answer questions. HLC1 on May 31 through June 2nd is a rare opportunity to take HLC1 training live at our beautiful rainbow home atop of a mountain in Fallbrook, California with beautiful views, and you get to enjoy my amazing stone charge water and work out in my beautiful gym. Additionally, This is the only HLC1 Live scheduled for 2024. So if you want to learn from a true master in person and get your most important questions answered, don't miss this special opportunity. If you want to meet other holistically minded people and grow your conscious community, there's no better place than our live workshops. In this important, practical three-day training program, you will learn how to apply the 1-2-3-4 approach to developing long-term body-mind changes and how to apply the five essential program design factors. Learn to use your check nutrition and lifestyle questionnaires for assessing physiological load and making essential diet and lifestyle changes. Understand the relationship between the six check foundation principles and body-mind stress. Learn how to apply the six check foundation principles to balance your body system so you can exemplify well-being. Identify common roadblocks to success with diet and lifestyle modifications and gain simple solutions. Discover how to use the less is more principle of exercise prescription. Early bird investment is only $810 for this three-day workshop if you register before April 16th. To learn more and register, go to chekinstitute.com forward slash core. That's chekinstitute.com forward slash core. I'm sure this will be a life-changing workshop for anybody that attends, and I look forward to seeing you all here at our beautiful home in Fallbrook, California. Enjoy. One of the things that I learned studying Mendel's work that I also found very helpful is when you take a painful situation, a conflict, and then you bring it into your heart and ask your heart to show you what it sees. And I've done these exercises where you paint the X energy or draw it, you draw the U energy, and then you go in your heart and let it give you an image. And man, some of the images my heart has given me are just so incredible. And just the act of painting that itself is so healing. And so it's, it's, I, I really do love 
all of Arnold Mendel's books and, and his concepts, they're really cutting edge. You know, he's, 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 a, he's such a unique combination of talents and perceptual fields. What a blessing for you to have been able to do all that work with him. Yes, yes. And then like any good teacher, he really supports me in taking that and running with it and applying it and unfolding, especially the second training work. And so it's really, really exciting, exciting work. So we actually have a lot of tools and I love the idea of training, right? Like even, you know, people think come in and they feel so bad about, oh gosh, we have such terrible relationships up and whatever. And so taking it from a pathology-based model to a training model is really, really great. I, you know, you do that. You've done that for centuries with people around athletics and stuff, right? It's not like, come on, maybe you're in terrible shape, but let's start training, right? Well, yeah, you know, and my work's always been holistic. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that, but I'm a therapist, not, a, you know, a kind of a typical gym guy. So when people no, come to that. see me, they always have problems. And, and, and when I work with elite athletes, it's like, I, why, why have I had this knee operated on five times in a row and it seems to never get better? That's right. Or this is the third time I've blown a disc out. There you go. So I, I have to really try to help them resolve that so they can look at what are the compounding factors, which often it often turns out to be relationship troubles with spouses particularly and also with self-esteem problems or you know you know all the things that are commonly hiding behind these things frequently it's just lack of knowledge of diet and lifestyle factors and doing silly shit like staying up late at night you know watching tv and drinking alcohol and smoking cigars and living like a rich person because a lot of them are very rich but not realizing anything about how the the body works and how the rhythms of nature work and you know all these things but because the patients that come see me are often very complex i've had to look deeper and deeper and study more and more and more because you get people that everything you know in your toolbox just isn't enough so you have to say well you know where is this i always see each client as a gift and i say what what are they what are they bringing me to teach me where I need to go and grow myself so that I can have a mutually beneficial relationship with this person. So really my, my patients have been my biggest teachers because they're the ones that showed me where I didn't know enough and gave me the reason to look, you know, there, there you go. There you go. Amy Mandel always calls it two monks at the river. Yeah, two, exactly. Right? We're studying that river together. And I know one of the Tibetan teachers I went to at, teaching dream yoga, he used to say, do you think you're in a different forest if you're someone's teacher? It just means you're like two steps ahead in the same forest, right? So you can clear a few branches, right? So it really is very humbling and that, that our learning is really entangled with the people that come with us. And I love what you say. I know you and me and Mandel's, Jason, all of us really work in a very holistic way. There is no such thing as just an injury or an illness without the complexity. One of my colleagues once stopped me and she said, can you help me a second? I said, okay, what? She said, once a year, I knock myself unconscious. (laughs) 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 I said, that's quite a skill. How do you do that? She says, you know, I'll just find like something in the ceiling, whatever, I'll bam and I'm out. And I said, show me the position you land in. And she showed me. And I said, what's in that position? And she said, oh, my God. She said, I've had this call to study shamanism for years, and I ignore it. And I said, so what about following that calling? So she went off and studied shamanism, whatever. That was the end of smashing her head to put her in that altered state. So there's no such thing as just an accident, right? Every, every, everything we do is full of meaning. That's the core of process work. Well, at least you can congratulate her for using her head. <laughs> <laughs> but you know but but she is all of us that's one of my most brilliant one of the most brilliant facilitators in the world but that was you know all of us have that little place that little place where we just like well i just fall all the time i trip over stuff because i'm clumsy but if you stop and you slow that down and you really go into it and you go into the position you land and you study every aspect of it 
it's full of dreaming and meaning, right? Yes. Yeah. I think everything's speaking to us. I mean, I think we we really lost something when we departed from the polytheistic experience of life. And when we when we became so materialistic that we no longer spoke to the plants and the trees and the animals became objects that you can just do anything you want to in research because the B.F. Skinner model is that they're just machines that, you know, so now I think a lot of our pains physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually are the pains of brainwashing and disconnection and, and our, our, our diseases and our body pains are really attempts by our own soul and our own spirit to say, hey, wake up, you know, I, what do I have to do? Put you in bed to get your attention? That's exactly right. You know, I sometimes teach with my friend Emmanuel, who was the first process certified worker in Kenya. So he told me how the Kenyan elders heal you, that he said one of the biggest healings is that if you're ill, they consider it a disconnection from the earth. And so they just put you back on the earth and they reconnect you to the earth and they found out how you disconnected from the earth and then you get better. That's interesting. It reminds me of, I was studying a book many years ago and it was looking at the physical, emotional, mental well-being and crime rates amongst different populations and peoples. And it had identified that there was this one tribe of people, I believe there was somewhere near India, but the one thing that they did whenever somebody was getting in trouble or causing disturbances in the tribal society, what they would do is they would put them in the center of a circle and everybody would make a circle around them. And the only, they didn't have any courts. They didn't have police. They had none of that. And everybody in the circle would tell them something they loved about them. Oh, you're blowing my mind. And that's all they had to do is just remind the person that everybody there loved them, and that knocked the, the, the bad shit right out of them. Well, I'll tell you why you're blowing your mind. One of the things I developed, now, you, when, you, when I say developed, I give a name to what's been done forever. But I, I do something called community-based healing. And what that means is that anytime somebody works in the middle in one of my seminars, we do community-based healing, which means that after they're done, at least three people say the most supportive, incredible, loving things to them. And so that's that similar concept of healing. And plus what it does is it protects them. Like, let's say you do this huge thing in the middle and then you start to go away and you criticize yourself because you went over an edge and you, you did something very revealing or vulnerable. It protects you from that critic that instead you're thinking, well, actually, so-and-so said that I did the most amazing, touching work. So I think a lot of our wounding comes in public, but a lot of our healing needs to go back to in public. That's why a lot of the group process and the conflict work we do is an attempt to heal in public. We're taking things out of the, the office. The office is very important, but the community can help heal community wounds. Yeah. Whenever I, I've conducted healings for years, I did in my holistic lifestyle coach training level two program, which is the professional training on the last day, Dr. Oliver would, he taught with me for many years. He's very, very experienced doctor, uh, a sound healer, an artist, uh, you know, a very well-developed human being. And we would choose the person in the class that was the most in pain, out of balance, injured, disrupted. And we would do a sound healing. But the point I'm bringing up is that in every single case, there was a profound effect on everybody in the audience. I mean, oftentimes it would bring a catharsis. Sometimes the challenge of five or six people would go into a cathartic healing response just by being in the presence of the sound healing. And um, so point being is that whenever we're in the presence of genuine healing for any one person, I think it reaches inside of us and touches us in the same place because we often don't realize we're also carrying that wound in some particular that's right. way. That's right. That's why when we when we get to what group process is around conflict work, that's why group process is so powerful because maybe one person is working in the middle on something or two people are working on a relationship. But group process is world issues and those issues are in all of us. So everybody is so touched. And so you many times see the whole group is crying or people stomping or you know it, it's it's a way of working collectively. Yeah. How is your 
18 years plus of Aikido training help support your conflict work? I'm, I've, it's interesting too, before you answer, because I've studied a lot of masters of different types. And it seems to be that Aikido is sort of something that keeps sneaking in there, like various Tai Chi masters, Qigong masters, healers. There must be at least a dozen of them that I've studied that that are you know high level in Aikido training. I'm, I'm just curious, what's the connection there as well as your own experience of Aikido and how it's helped you? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the founder of Aikido O Sensei or uh, Morihei Urashiba said that, and he was like the the top one of the top martial artists in Japan in many martial arts. When he formed Aikido, he said it was going to his goal was to bring peace to the world. Mm, very good. He said a lot of strange things about martial arts. Like he said, if you hurt your opponent, you have failed in Aikido. Now that's a really different kind of martial art. Yeah, it is. That's really different, and so. Um, how I use it for me, it's the embodiment of process work. In other words, like you can tell me, like, take the other side and that goes up into my head and my body says, I'm not taking the other side. <laughs> I'm not moving. But in Aikido, it teaches you to move. So when one of the most common things you do, if somebody attacks you is you blend with them, you take their side, somebody punches you. Now I'm on their side and then I'm free to move. And so it teaches you physically to blend with people. That's the first thing. The second thing is I've been studying now the last four years with Hiroshi Akeda Shihan, who is a Japanese teacher, but he now lives in Boulder. And he's developed and taught much of the inner meditation and inner work of Aikido. And so he's amazing to watch because he just says, I don't fight with people. I just stay connected to my center and I move my center. But I once saw him do things like move his center and have one person pushing him and 13 people pushing them. And I saw him move his center and watch 14 people fall over. So that's a very different idea. I'm not fighting with anybody. I'm just dancing. I'm just moving my center. If you want to attack me, I'm going to move my center and that's going to move you. So it's a really important idea is minimizing harm to your opponent, connecting with your opponent. So Ikeda Sensei says, if I don't connect my center to my opponent, I can't really do anything effective except use force. So how has that changed me? Well, Sage always to says, has said to me, oh, these years, go back and do more Aikido. Why? It's made me a lot more peaceful. It's made me a lot more confident. As a very small man, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, 5'6 and weigh about 130 something. I was always kind of intimidated so much in on the street or when working, I, I now have, a, it's given me a different level of confidence. And when you're confident, you're less aggressive. That's true. Yeah. Right. It just teaches you. I mean, I can't just say, oh my God, that man is a force from heaven at, or whatever at 74 or five, but he is one of the gentlest human beings I've ever known. I would not attack that man, <laughs> 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 but he's so gentle and so generous. And, um, and so I've learned to do that. And so one of the things Sage says is she said, it connects you so deeply with me that she said, it's changed how you dance. It's changed how you play. And it's changed how you make love because it energetically connects us with the other person. And so if I'm energetically connected with you, I don't, I don't have to fight with you. I can just move my own energy and I can move the situation. So it's, again, I think it's the embodiment of this work. And for the first time ever, I think Akeda Sensei and I, probably in Tokyo in the fall, are going to teach these two methods together and study how they can support each other. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that question. I, I love Akito. I train like crazy. It's a difficult art for me because it can be also very internal, and it's very technical. It takes a long time to master it, but you can get some of the very basic principles very quickly. Yeah. I understand now exactly why so many of these great teachers have involved themselves in Aikido. It's one of the martial arts that I never really put much time into studying to understand. I've studied many others of them, but for some reason, Aikido has always been sitting out on the fringes. So hearing that from you helps bring some clarity into me about, okay, now I see the connection, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. If I know, knowing what I know of you, if you ever have a chance to do something, and maybe I'll let you know if, if he's going to be down in your area with the Kedis and say what, because he teaches how to strengthen your Tantian, your center, and then he teaches how to move that through you to your opponent to use it martially or for healing or whatever. But the way he teaches is so clear and direct. So it's a it's a really good application of of how to work with the energy body and and how to work with it in relationship. Yes. Well, with the amount of experience you have in conflict resolution, can you share three or four reasons, maybe the top three or four reasons people end up in conflicts that are polarized enough to damage relationships? I mean, I know that's a big question because of the diversity of people's issues, but archetypally, I would imagine there is three or four kind of common triggers or things that start to fire. It's true. There really are. You know, the we say, or I say in process work, that the number one cause of most of the world conflicts is the unconscious use of rank and power. In process work, I talk about different kinds of rank, social rank, like your age, your race, your gender, your economic level, your education level, your health level. All of those kind, your sexual orientation, all of those things give you a certain amount of rank and power depending on the society you're in. Then there's structural rank, like what are your formal positions in any organization? Then there's psychological rank, like did you come from a healthy family background or did you have access to good therapists and teachers or Paul Check or whatever who could mm-hmm. help you help you develop where you didn't have your strengths? Can you, can you, do you have psychological power? Can you stay centered? And finally, spiritual rank. Like, can you feel connected to something deeper, something bigger than yourself, something universal that can be there for you and energize you? And so one of the things we say in process work is the more rank you have, the less aware you need to be, right? Like if I'm, I have a lot of power and a lot of safety. I don't have to be very careful walking down the street. I can walk fairly unaware. If I'm at great risk, I have to walk with incredible awareness. And so how do we how do we become aware of our rank and how we carry it? And how can we carry it consciously? And how can we carry it for the benefit of others? And how can we carry it with sensitivity? So it's that unconsciousness of rank. And it comes up as all kinds of social issues in relationship, all kinds of inequalities. Like, for example, that I'm a man in a heterosexual relationship brings up all kinds of rank and power issues that I have to even guess into because my partner may just have adjusted to living at that level. Um, I'll give you an example. One time, many, many years ago, I was teaching in Canada with a friend and I had a dream that Sage was going to leave me because of my economic rank in our relationship, because I was doing more at that time. I was out earlier, I'm older, and I was more successful. So I called her and I said, I had a dream that you're going to leave me because of the way I use my economic power in this relationship. She said, that is the craziest thing I ever heard of. Why don't you go back and teach your seminar and not bother me? So an hour later, an hour later, she called me back and she said, how did you know? That's so funny. She, she had to think about it. (laughs) She said, that's right. That's rank and power. You see, you just start to adjust to the inequalities. You think that's the way life is. But she said, it's so weird. I've been thinking for months at the back of my mind. I'm not happy in our relationship about something. And I've been even thinking these crazy thoughts about leaving you. And as soon as you said that, you nailed it. And I said, well, you know, I said, our economic structure has been based on sort of this radical woman therapist in Eugene who said we should try this kind of economic structure. And I said, but I asked my friend I'm teaching with who's a, who was a lesbian woman, and she said, I would never do that structure. I hate that structure. So Sage said, let's throw that out and let's make a new structure. So we did. So, Paul, I ran into that therapist at the health food store and I told her what happened. And she said, oh, I got rid of that structure years ago. That almost <laughs> wrecked my marriage. <laughs> she, 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 she grew, but for, she forgot to tell you. <laughs> she forgot to send an email to the rest of us. Yes, exactly. I was just going to say, I can tell you how I handle that. I make the most money by far amongst my two wives, but I honestly haven't got a clue how much money I have. I turn it all over to Penny 
And I say, my only rule is if I can't buy the books I want, the smoke I want, <laughs> then we have to have a talk about the money. <laughs> See, I should have, when I ran into you years ago, I should have asked you rather than that woman. That's a great system. <laughs> it works really well. There's no question about, I don't even know how much money I have. I, I have to ask them how much money did I make this year, or this month. It's so I, wonderful. I, I don't it's work so for wonderful. money. I just, I work to, to, to really express my love and to help as many people as I can. But I, but I know money has is a linchpin in so many of the relationships I've worked with. It's probably the most common one, actually. It's a, it's a big thing. And you see, it's that unconsciousness. I thought I was doing great. And Sage was like, well, I'm a woman and he's a man, whatever, and I should just live with this. And I'm not even going to notice that it bothers me. So that's what's so difficult about rank. And one way to use your higher rank is to guess into the person who has lower rank. And don't make them do all the work. You hear that a lot, for example, in anti-racism work, where the African-American community will say, don't make us do all the work around pointing out the agony of racism. If you're in the mainstream, use your awareness, use your rank to study and learn and inquire. So it's how we use our rank is, is of huge importance. And to go for more and more happiness and equality. Um, so that is that is one of the biggest things. And the second thing is that our minds, you know, that are just pretty dualistic. I mean, society society supports us in splitting at really young ages. And so those splits we talked about then go into the relationship. In process work, you say you can't have an outer conflict unless you have the same conflict inside you. So my split goes into my relationship. And then I, I, I fight with my partner as my split. And that's why we do things like X and U work. The third thing I would say is that we're like, most of us are walking trauma embodiments, not only our personal trauma, but historical trauma. One of the things I've been studying the last 10 years, especially in myself, when I felt like I had cleared most of my, my family trauma, I remember Mendel once said to me, now you've got a number of years still to do on your historical trauma. So we have all these things that trigger us and, it, and we need to learn how to work with our trauma and clear it and how to work with triggers in relationship. We were talking about Aikido, Paul. And so one of the things you do in Aikido is you stand in a position called my eye. My eye means the distance at which you can't, my opponent, where I can stay connected with my opponent, but they can't easily kick or punch me. But in an intimate relationship, martially, we're this close. And so all our central points are vulnerable. And so, you know, relationship pushes every button we've got. And so a lot of what we're teaching in process work is how to navigate triggering in relationships. And a lot of my work is helping people, and I'm sure your work too, is helping people clear their personal and historical traumas. So, that, right, I, I often say that most of the conflicts we're having between our partner, most of the intensity has nothing to do with the moment. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why having a committed practice where you spend time in what would classically be called meditation, but I find it in Tai Chi, Qigong, any repetitive movement where your ego is pacified by the movement just enough that you can experience the unconscious. I've also found through the use of plant medicines, if they're used intelligently, they really do a great job of you know bringing the dragons out of the dungeon. But my point is, is that if if we just take some time each day to really just be quiet and let take stand back and do an alchemy what they call sublimating rise above and just watch what's bubbling in the well of self and you see all this crazy shit coming up and and most of it is like you say generational it's mom dad grandma grandpa and and stuff that you have to start looking into you like where in the world does that come from but I think most people have made themselves so busy and so distracted that they end up just falling into these repeated trauma dramas and, you know, they lose jobs, they lose relationships, they lose confidence in themselves. And it's, it's, it, it's really, I would say it's reached a, a dangerous pinnacle in the world right now. I don't think we can keep playing this distraction game much longer, which is paradoxical because you got Zuckerberg and 
all these others that are doing just such an amazing job of pulling people right into additional virtual realities and getting them further and further from a relationship with themselves, with their dog, their cat, their mother, their brother, their exactly. spouse. Exactly. And I think that's just a death stroke. It is. It is. You hit it on the nose. You've got to have that interest in that. Like my partner looked at me this way and I went almost went through the roof or they said this little whatever, or they touched me a little bit too quickly or whatever. And I went through what is getting triggered in me. And, and we have a word I really like in process work. We call that your psychological inheritance. In other words, it's not just what's happened to you in your life, but you don't just inherit from your parents, hopefully a little money or an apartment or whatever. You pick a painting, you inherit the stuff that they didn't work on. And especially, and, and especially the historical trauma. And so that gets triggered all the time. So what we're teaching is how to recognize those triggers. The early stuff I studied, Paul, was just like, well, let yourself get triggered and just give it to your partner. But that just burns up relationships, right? Yeah, Jung said all children are tasked with the unfinished business of their parents' lives. And I think that's just terribly true. Yeah, terribly true. And how to do that work. And then you've done that. And then, but your parents, you know, the, one of the things about big historical trauma is that people don't talk about it. Like when I've studied, I came from a family that had a lot of Holocaust history and whatever. I never even knew until a couple of years ago, I was talking to my aunt in her 90s and she said, oh, where were you working? I said, I just got back from Warsaw. She said, oh, do you know we're from Poland? I was like in my 60s. I didn't know we're from Poland. Wow. One, of the, one of the things that families do when they've had historical trauma on both sides, I've worked with Jewish families, I've worked with German families, I've worked with Japanese families. Nobody talks much about the war around World War II or around the trauma. It's all covered up, not mentioned, so it hangs around like ghosts Yeah, in our, in our lives. So how do we work with that? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's good that you're going to have all this stuff in your training program to help people kind of know where to look in the closet because a lot of people just don't even know where to look, you know? That's right. That's right. You don't even know, and you don't even know it's with you. One of the, one of the stories I have is, you know, I, I was training body workers and sometimes I'll see a body worker and they're, you know, and they're working on somebody like this, <laughs> you know, like, oh yeah. my God, you know, and sometimes I'll say to them, you got to work with me because I'm afraid you're going to hurt somebody. And the number of times that what's come out is their own, for example, their father's unprocessed trauma in their country running through their body. And like, then we'll work on that historical trauma and then I'll go back and watch them do body work. You know, it like changes their whole physiology. It changes. It's a, it's, those are really powerful things. So like you say, we need, we need trainings that teach people how to access that stuff, right? And how to clear it. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, I've had the experience because I use a lot of different approaches, but I've had the experience of, of people just going, oh my God, you know, once they find it, it's like the dominoes just go bang, 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 bang. And they go, wow, there I can see this has been running through my life for a long time. That's it. That's it. It's all one thread. And you pull that thread and all of a sudden your body, your relationship, your work, your finances, you know, everything like you're taking that block out and the river flows again. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. You know, people worldwide are not only finding it hard to find organic and free-range, regeneratively farmed animal foods, but as you surely know, it's almost impossible to find anything worth eating in stores, airports, gas stations, or even in the stores that should have real food. Additionally, most children are sent to school to eat microwave processed, chemically raised, and chemically laden garbage from school cafeterias or out of their lunchbox simply because most parents just aren't aware of the dangers of commercial food. But the truth is, there are no shortcuts to health and wellness. Unless, of course, you let Paleo Valley do the work for you. Autumn Smith, founder of Paleo Valley, is not only a mother who understands the importance of feeding children wholesome, clean foods, but is a holistic nutritionist who pours her soul into all Paleo Valley products. And Paleo Valley's meat sticks are made from regeneratively farmed animals that are raised with the highest possible standards of care. Paleo Valley's meat sticks are also fermented, which significantly enhances the nutritional quality and flavor of them. 
My family and I love them and carry them everywhere we go, be it during rides in the car, outings, ski trips, or we put them in the kids' lunchbox and they love them. In fact, many people I know resort to them as a meal when time is tight on the road or traveling by air. I know of no better portable food or snack food anyone can eat without losing quality or satisfaction, and we love sharing them with our guests and students at our Rainbow Workshops. Paleo Valley's meat sticks come in beef, turkey, and pork maple bacon flavor. To try Paleo Valley's meat sticks, including the brand new grass-fed venison sticks, and save 15% on your purchase, go to paleovalley.com forward slash check 15. That's paleovalley.com forward slash C-H-E-K-1-5. And your 15% discount will automatically be applied when you check out. No promo code is required. Here's a question I put in for you because this is something I've run into many times. I love, I love it. What do you suggest if we are making an honest effort to resolve a conflict with a loved one or someone at work within a group or in a group and the other party has absolutely no interest in resolving the conflict? They just want to keep fighting. Well, that's what I love about both process work and Aikido is that it's always ideal if both people will do it. But if not, one person can do it. Like if I'm in a conflict, say with my partner and say she's not in the mood to take my side or do any of this stuff. She's tired. I can do it. I take my side. I go over and I stand on her side and I said, you must be really upset because, and I really go into it. Like, let's say another archetypal fight is around house clean, right? <laughs> right? So let's say, let's say I'm like, I cleaned the house and I don't know why you're complaining that the kitchen's still messy. Are you kidding me? That kitchen's a, you, you, you missed this, you missed that, you did this, you did that. And we're fighting and fighting. And she, it's escalating. She doesn't want to take my side, but I take her side. And I say, you know, I think on your side, you have like this aesthetic sort of artistic sense of, of the kitchen. Is that right? And when it's not really up to your standard, it must it must be really painful for you or something. It like, like fingers on a scratch board. Is that kind of the feeling? Yeah. And now I'm, and also I'm a man. And don't you sometimes feel like a, collectively as men, sometimes we like dump the cleaning load more on you. And that's exactly how I feel. So now I want to say on my side, it is true that I really made a big effort, but I see your point. I see your point. I'm going to go back and fix that kitchen. And I'm going to try to up my standards. I really want you to be happy and whatever. So I'm doing all the work here. She doesn't have to do anything except maybe say, mm-hmm. And it's the same thing in Aikido. My partner attacks me. Maybe they don't want to be open to connecting and energy, but I put my center connected to their center and I move and they move. What, I, what I'd like to, to sort of focus on, I mean, I understand and I appreciate that. I'll give you an example. Let's say you're having an argument with one of your children and it gets hot and, and you say something like, look, I'm having a hard time staying connected to you at the heart right now. Let's, let's just put this on the table and come back when we're a little calmer and see if we can work this out together. And, and then so you turn to walk away, but they follow you and they just keep going at you and going at you and they'll follow you right out the door to your car or to your office or whatever. And they just relentlessly want to stay in the fight even when you know it's not healthy to do so. So I'm sort of asking, how do you do? Because because there's there's people that just flat out love to fight. <laughs> yeah, that is true. And and you can't it, you can't always do it. But like what I might do at that point is I might say, wow, no wonder you're so irritated with me and following me. I'm using my rank. I have I have rank, I have a kind of psychological rank that I can just walk away from conflict. And I see, I see that's hard for you. So no wonder I'm irritating you even more. Now I'm, making, <laughs> now I'm using my rank awareness, right? Right. And so I go through these different tools trying to find what will move that conflict. And so one way to look at it is if I, if I can't move that conflict, I haven't quite hit that right vibration yet. So I'm going to keep trying. You know, another way to look at it is that person just loves fighting and I'll never stop them. But maybe I will. If I have that, it's like an Aikido. That's not working. Should work. This isn't working. This isn't working. Wait a minute. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Now I got it. You see? So you just keep moving. You keep trying. You know, one thing I do in cases like that is 
I have a meta discussion. What I mean a meta discussion is that I don't discuss it while we're fighting. But then maybe there's a cooler moment. I take that kid out. We go out to dinner or something like that. And then in a calm moment, we talk about it. I say, I, I notice you like to fight. Like I remember a time in my relationship, Paul, when Sage and I did that, where Sage said, you like to fight a lot more than I do. And you have no idea how it's starting to wear me down. Really? I thought you were into it. No, it's going on way too. So we're having a discussion about our fighting style when we're not fighting. It's a meta discussion. Yeah. It's a good way to kind of separate yourself from it, but still acknowledge the process that's unfolding without that's the right. tension in, in the middle. That's right. It's like when I do sex therapy, I say, you know, like, really, like you're in the middle of making love and you start to give your partner a lot of feedback that may not be the best moment. Go out to dinner. <laughs> and over a nice dinner, you know, you say, you know, the way you grab me, it's like, it's really, could you mind, you know, because I really want to be close with you. You know, so a lot of times you need a little bit of a different context to be able to have the distance to talk about something that's not working. Yeah. I think people think way too much when they're having sex. If they were really having sex, there would be no mind left. I love that. I'm right with you. <laughs> now, this question, when, when we were talking about it, it kind of threw me for a loop, but I think I've got it right. What are some of the methods you use to facilitate conflict? Uh -huh. Well, so let's talk first about when we talk about two-party conflict, all those methods that we mentioned, like teaching, you know, using the three, using the four phases, those work really good. Now, if I'm a facilitator, what I need to learn is what I call fluid neutrality. Fluid neutrality, you know, a lot of us get really messed up. Like I'm very careful who I send people to for couples therapy because most couples therapists will say, well, I kind of like this one. <laughs> like one time Sage and I, I was writing this book on sex. And so we went to this really famous Tantra teacher, because I needed to write more chapters on Tantra. And that teacher would work with Sage and I, and the way she would start every session is she would go stand behind Sage and she would say, Sage, this amazing goddess, the goddess's gift to this world. And then she'd come over and she'd say, hello, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then she'd say, now it's time to work. And I remember I had an injury that I was thinking, oh, good, she's going to work on me. She'd say, Sage, I think you should get on the table, you know? And so after a number of sessions, Sage and I started to have a terrible time with each other. And so I didn't talk about it then, but I took her out to breakfast afterwards. And I said, do you notice what's happening? Sage said, seems great to me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I said, well, that's the problem because she's always on your side. And I said, it's creating so much tension in our relationship that this learning experience is going to really hurt our relationship. And Sage said, explain it to me. I explained it. She said, okay, we have to stop working with her. So most facilitators are not neutral. Yeah, now, she's basically inserting rank and power right from the beginning. And so when you go to couples therapy, if the facilitator takes only one side, she can really mess up a relationship. And so when what we train people in facilitating is what I call fluid neutrality. And that means that it's too hard to always just stay like this neutral Buddha. So I can take one side, but then I take the other side. So I go and support, like say I'm doing, I'm working with a group. And I say, on this side, you really sound really frustrated about this. And you feel like the other side's not listening. They're not, isn't that right? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, now on this side, but you must feel like you're trying really hard and that they're not seeing you. Is that right? And so I'm going from one side to the other. We teach a kind of fluid neutrality around facilitating. And so you've got your tools, you've got your three-step, you've got your four phase, you've got fluid neutrality. Now, when we move up to the group level, we use all of that, but we have three big tools we use for group conflict. The first one I've really helped evolve a lot in my training is called five-minute open forums. That means in five minutes, I facilitate a group and I heat things up really hot, really fast. <laughs> I'm sure that can be interesting. <laughs> yes. And the minute they start to cool, we stop and talk about it. That's a five-minute method. I'll go and I'll speak for, let's say this side is conflicting with this side. And I'll go and say the hottest things that this side isn't saying. 
and the hottest things that that side isn't saying. And the minute somebody goes, hmm, hmm, on one side, I'll say, that's a cool spot. Let's stop and talk for 15 minutes about what just happened. It's a really intense, but a lot of organizations will let you do that because you're only asking them to be uncomfortable for five minutes. So then there's a bigger thing we call a regular open forum, and that's about an hour and a half to two hour process of working with a group conflict. And the main purpose of an open forum is just to let as many people as possible speak and be, be witnessed. So, so I say somebody from this side, we usually start with some speakers at the beginning representing the different positions. And then now somebody from this side spoke. Could somebody from this side answer them? How about now somebody from this side? It's a, it's a public forum in democracy is what it is. And in deep democracy, making space for all the voices. And then there's group, there's group process. That's our, that's our big tool. And that you, I worked with groups from four up to I've worked with groups where 750 people are all processing at once. The that's a lot. That, that's a lot. So we're, we're, there are steps to that kinds of group process. Like we sort the topics. We get consensus. We build an umbrella linking the topics. We show the different roles in the group, the different positions present, and we ask people to try taking the different sides and switching sides. We catch the hot moments and we focus on them. We catch the cool moments and we focus on them. We bring in the hidden roles that aren't being represented. For example, like say we're doing group conflict around race and everybody's saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I've read a couple books on it, and whatever. And the other side saying, well, I'm, a, I, I'm hurt by racism. So the thing that's missing is the more racist position. And so we bring that in as a role so that people can interact with it. We call that the ghost role, right? So we bring in the missing things that are everybody saying, well, it's not here. There's no racists here. There's no terrorists here. There's no Trump isn't in the room. We represent that. And we, we then get some temporary resolution and we frame what happened. And then we talk about where we'll go from there. So there are steps that will teach people. Group process is a very, very powerful way of working on the social issues present and everybody's body and psychology all at once. What is your new course focusing on? More of a personal conflict resolution group or both? Everything. Because the techniques are pretty much the same. And so we start the course with how to assess a system and then how to intervene more with communication skills. Now we're working more on the individual level, but that we say in groups, there's always four levels, the individual relationship, the group you're with and the world. And so we work on all those levels. So we teach communication stuff and real deep stuff, not like just listening and all that's very important, but like, how do you catch the subtle signals? Bring those in, unfold them, right? Then we teach the two-party conflict work methods, some that I've learned, I've already talked about. Then we teach how to work with rank and power. Then we teach the five-minute open forum, the regular open forum, group process. Then we teach visioning work, deep visioning work, writing vision statements. So all of these things you could do with your couple, you could do in your family, as family work, you could do at work, you could do between two groups, you could do between two countries. I do it on the street. Sometimes I have to do it many times on the street. If it, you know, if, if, if it works, it works everywhere. Yes. I understand the principle. It's, you know, cause the underlying, the underlying issues insinuate themselves from the individual to the couple, to the family, to the corporation to the nation, you know. That's right. That's right. The corporation, that's those are people in there. And they're having relationship struggles and they're having body problems and they're having their own blocks and they start losing money or people start quitting or you know, but it's all tied together. And so at that level and then at the smallest level when you're working with a couple, couples always think, gee, this is just us. But we know as a therapist We've seen like 10 couples with the same presentation in the last week. So we know yeah. that the, the couple is in the midst of a world process. Yeah. There's something I want to loop back to, which we haven't taken this angle, but I think it's important. And that is, well, rank and power do tend to cause problems in relationship. I also think that a lot of problems come when people 
I'm speaking more specifically in like husband, wife or boyfriend, girlfriend, or, but mostly husband and wife when we don't acknowledge rank and power. And I'll give you a good example. Prior to meeting Penny, I, I had plenty of relationships and I always made it clear in the beginning of the relationship what my focus was, why I'm here in the world, you know, that my Czech Institute was my mission and that, you know, if you're expecting me to show up at dinner at a certain time every day, that's not a good idea. And that, you know, if, if our relationship stops me from being who I am, it won't be helpful and I can't be in a relationship like that because I'd learned through a series of relationships what kept getting in the way. Exactly. And, and what, what I found is that there's also a need to acknowledge, like I acknowledge, for example, Penny is the master of money and, and she's sort of the pilot. She's actually a, a licensed pilot and she is a pilot. Like she, wow. she directs the, the organization. Uh, you know, we have a CEO now cause it got too big for Penny to handle by herself, but we have multiple businesses and Penny is the orchestrator. Angie is, she's in charge of the farm. She's in charge of the orchards and the gardens. She's got her own clients and she's sort of the master organizer of the kids schedules and interfacing with Penny. My, my function is as the founder of the Institute and, and the creator of the content and the sort of the chief breadwinner, so to speak, is I have to have protection to do what I have to do. And if, if that isn't kept sacred, then I'm, I get too stressed and I can't do what I do. Then we're all in trouble because we can't survive without making an X amount of money, which for us is not a small amount. That's what you call a system. That's right. Yeah. So I think a lot of relationships, and not, not to be sexist, but because I've coached so many people, Problems often happen when women start resenting their husband because he's working a lot or he's busy and they take it as a personal affront that he's ignoring me or he doesn't love the kids. And sometimes there is too much of a fixation by the male on work, but there's often a, a lack of awareness of the fact that if that person, be it the man or the woman, wasn't doing what they do, there would be nothing for them to survive on or the relationship wouldn't work. And the paradox that I find is women often, and sometimes men tend to hunt for and seek out very powerful people because at conscious or unconscious levels, it's almost like, look how good I am. I've got so-and-so. But then when they get them, they try to control them and change them and don't realize that the very type of person you are looking for because of who they are, is not someone that's going to be amenable to being toyed with like that. So the, the, what I'm shaping the question is, how important is it also to acknowledge rank and power because it's necessary in the relationship? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I mean, first of all, you know, if we look at couples where, of course, in many heterosexual couples, the, the woman is out doing, you know, the role switch, right? There's sometimes the man is out more, sometimes the woman is out earning, and of course, in and gay and bi and trans and all the and poly and there's so many kinds of couples well of course one of the things process work is always talking about is that deep diversity you know that we we support so when i when i address this i have to you know do it within that framework to know that there's incredible diversity in what is a couple and how couples organize but the point you make is really important that you start with where you are and you start with what you bring and you start with what you need and there's a rank in it. And one of the things you, you mentioned right at the beginning was you said, I tell people I have a mission. Yeah. Now, the fact that you or I have a mission gives us a lot of rank and power if somebody doesn't so much have awareness of their mission. Right. So we, we can acknowledge that from the beginning. But I think the problem that you're talking about, I, I do a lot of work. I call it with in conflict with couples and with businesses around implicit agreements. Where we get in trouble is that we haven't made the agreement explicit. So if the agreement is explicit and it's renewed, like, okay, we're a system. You're really good at this. Let's make you the captain of that. I'm really good at this. So I'm going to do my thing in the world because I'm going to provide all the income. You're going to do this and this and this. 
I'm fine with what I'm doing. Are you fine with what I'm doing and what you're doing? Great. Now we have an explicit agreement. But the problem why couples get into trouble is that those agreements aren't made and they're often implicit. I, I, I have a really bad story to tell you about it. So <laughs> really bad. So one time I'm working with a couple and they had a discussion about their agreements around monogamy. And so the woman says to the man, if you ever cheat on me, I better not hear about it. The man thought that that gave him permission to have an open relationship and just not tell her. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's an implicit agreement he made with himself. <laughs> That's an implicit agreement. 15 years later, they come in because she finds out how many people he slept with and they did not have a clear sense on both sides of what the agreement was. So you see that a lot. Like, I, you know, like, like, I have to sit with Sage sometimes and I say, okay, I'm bringing in more of the money, but you're doing more of this. Is that still working for us? So you're constantly looking at those agreements to keep them explicit. So if the couple, and, and the problem is with rank and power is if you're in the higher rank, you've got to check it out with the person. Like, let's say the person says, no, it's great. I don't mind staying home and I'll do all the cleaning, all the cooking, all the shopping and take care of the kids. I'm fine with that. And then you yeah, watch your yeah, face, yeah. you know, and then you you've got to with the higher rank position say, I'm not sure you look really tired. Maybe we need to change that agreement and then watch their feedback. So that's what's so hard about making explicit agreements is that I get habituated by culture to think. So I'm a man. So I have to be doing this, even though it's way beyond my body or my dreams or my agreement. Or I'm a woman or I'm a gender fluid person and I have to be doing this. It's, it's complicated. That's why when we teach communication work, we teach a lot around double signals. Also, this happens in peace treaties and in business negotiations and all that. You know, If you don't bring in the double signal, so if I say to my partner, I don't mind working so many hours. I don't mind being the main provider. In my words of that, but in my double signals, why am I holding myself? What's in this head movement? All that's got to be brought into the negotiations. And my partner says, well, you know what? I just love the way our arrangement is. Yeah. No? <laughs> like, it's like saying I love you, but it means you're a pain in my ass. That's exactly right. And so you've got to gently bring out those signals. Now, if you call your partner on a signal, it's easier if you bring out your own signals. Well, wait a minute. Let me find out why I'm holding myself. Gee, I'm holding on to my strength. I guess my muscles. I guess I'm feeling, I'm feeling really challenged to do the workload. And I didn't even really know that. And I, I think I need more support from you. And so would you mind exploring your signals? Well, there's something in my mouth. I think I'm really angry. I haven't had a night out on my own for like three months and I'm pissed. Okay. Now, now we make the agreements alive. So that's a lot of what we teach in the conflict work is how to get all your parts into the discussion. Because if I just bring my nice, identified part in the other part is the thing that has all the power and will sabotage the agreement yeah i think that's hard for people because they're often afraid that if they tell the truth they're going to lose something yes but my experience has been as if you if we can teach people how to unfold the double signal so i'm not unfolding it about you i'm unfolding it about me gee i think i i'm I'm, I'm really being stretched. I need more support. I mean, you know, the good communication people, you know, teach that, like talk about what your experience is, what you're feeling and what you need, right? I'm not using blaming. I'm not using condemning. I think we can teach people to do it successfully. And when they do that negotiation and that agreement's there and they keep checking in on that agreement, then you you don't have those background fights. Like I can't be myself. Well, you know, I mean, one of the great things about rank discussions is that, is that rank over time in relationships tend to balance. And so maybe I have all the structural rank and all the social rank, but like maybe my partner's not getting enough acknowledgement of the amount of spiritual rank they carry or the amount of psychological rank. Yeah, or how much how much they keep you in the game. I mean, Penny, Penny keeps me and Angie in the game. Like she's the keel on the sailboat. Me and Angie are, might, might be moving the boat, but Penny's the one that holds the whole damn thing together. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. 
I imagine you know that magnesium is one of the minerals that people in North America are the most efficient in, but it's an extremely important mineral to have in your diet regularly. And believe it or not, Bioptimizers has improved what was already well known to be the best magnesium formula out there called Magnesium Breakthrough. So I've got Wade Lightheart with me to explain what it is they've done to improve this already excellent formula. Wade, what is new about your new Mag Breakthrough formula? Well, it's called sucrosomial magnesium. So we have seven different types of magnesium in Magnesium Breakthrough because they're uptaken by different parts of the body. But a new type of magnesium has been created called sucrosomial. And what it shows in the research in science is that it's actually even more absorbable by the body, particularly inside of the brain, which is a big aspect uh, to enhance neurotransmitter formation, as well as ensuring the rest and relax response in the nervous system that a lot of people will take magnesium for. They find it, you know, clocks them down, helps them sleep better, allows for the relaxation of striated and smooth muscle tissue in the body, which creates an energetic relief. And so when we added sucrosomial, we were able to demonstrate inside our lab facility that we were able to get better improvements. Of course, we have a partnership with the Birch International University. We have some patents we're working on, uh, which will kind of relay some of these things. But sucrosomial was a no-brainer when we added to the formula, improved the results or improved the uptake. And the reports back from our testing team were like, wow, this we get more results with less caps. And that's always the goal for our company. That's excellent. I love it. I, I always say, and people have probably heard me say it before, I just am so amazed how you guys are constantly and always improving and working your best to not only make better products for us, but it doesn't seem to me that it gets more expensive as you make them better. So that's a real gift to the world. Thank you. By Optimizers offers Living 4D with Paul Check listeners 10% off Magnesium Breakthrough and all their other products. Plus, there are always amazing gifts with purchase. So to grab yours, go to bioptimizers.com forward slash living 4D and use the promo code Paul10 when you check out. That's bioptimizers.com forward slash living, the number 4, D, and the discount code is Paul10. You know, a good example I want to share from my own life to help people Please. maybe understand how some of these things work out. Probably about three years ago now, there reached a point where we were doing what we always do, but Angie and Penny found themselves exhausted because they were spending so many hours a day cooking and cleaning. Penny would start getting behind on emails and, you know, I have a massive amount of communications coming mm -hmm. through and, and so... Yeah. It was causing a bottleneck and it was, and, and, and then it was hard for Angie because she wanted to make more money. So she, you know, because things like Steiner, we have kid, two kids in Steiner schools, they're each in different schools. It's very expensive. And so we were like realizing, okay, we've got to figure out how we can make more money if we're going to live this lifestyle and, and do what we're doing. And so Penny said, look, Paul, I spend so damn much time cooking and cleaning. And then Angie chimed in. She said, me too. And I said to them, look, you guys have to consider your earning potential per hour and say, okay. And so they, I think they guesstimated they were spending at least three to three and a half hours a day cooking and cleaning. I said, okay, Angie, at your rate, Angie's hourly rate is 400 bucks an hour. Right. That's, that's like $1,500 a day in the kitchen. You're losing by being in the kitchen. Right. That's some fancy food. <laughs> exactly. Right. And so Penny's you know, Penny, we don't, can't even put a, a rate on her because without her, none of us can do what we do. Yeah, so I said, look, person. the simple solution is we hire a chef, you know, yeah, it's going to cost us 55 or whatever thousand bucks a year or something, but we're, we're actually losing money because we can't make money when we're in this bottleneck situation. So the way we resolved it was we invested the money to hire a full-time chef and that freed Angie up to have more clients and not have to be cooking and cleaning because that doesn't turn her on. Freed Penny up to do what she needs to do more of, which allows us to better run workshops or run more workshops. And that way she's using her talents and her skills. And we hired a chef that's a check trained professional that wanted to be here and works really well here and fits into our kind of tribe. 
And so there's an example, for example, what, what I'm sharing with the listeners is you have to kind of look at where the bottlenecks are happening, where the rank and power problems are. And for example, it, it, a, a woman could say, well, look, you, you, you do what you want to do. But like you said, I haven't I got to the gym or uh, been able to do anything for me in X number of weeks, months or days. And I said, well, that's a great way to, to say, well, let's invest in a nanny or let's invest in uh, let's let's build a network and find other women that are in the same situation and say, OK, how about if you bring your kids over here on Tuesday? I'll watch them for four hours so you can go get a, a Pilates session in or a massage or go shopping. And then you rotate. So you create a tribe and you support each other. But most people are much happier to just sit in the conflict and the problems than they are to actually think about how do you resolve this. And I think that's one of the things I've seen over and over again is people don't actually stop and say, what can we do that's constructive so we can each get what we want and what we need, but they just brew and brew and brew and it ultimately bombs the relationship quite often. That was brilliant because you just gave many of the, you showed how to do many of the 12 steps. You did many of the 12 steps. You, you stepped into the role of a facilitator. As a team, you assessed, you did the first steps. You did the rank and power stuff. You communicated. You processed. You looked for an action plan. You yeah. put the action plan into action and you followed up. So you did about five or six of those steps. That's what we're teaching. And, and maybe it's that couples just get hopeless or they just don't. They just, I'll tell you, I have so many people say, they say like, well, I hate this, you know, but that's just the way life is. You know, there's a sense of resignation. And so what we're doing is we're injecting grounded hope into systems by saying that most systems, like you look at worker satisfaction in most jobs, you look at worker turnover, you look at sick rates, you know, there's all these books on dysfunctional organizations. We're saying we can teach you these steps to move from dysfunction to function to well-being, to abundance. It's just training. So I don't yeah, really think yeah. it's the couples don't want to do it. I think if, I mean, most of the time when they get to us as therapists, they're like, well, is there anything we can do? Yeah. Yeah. Try this. Try that. Yeah. Let's, let's renegotiate. Let's look at rank and power. Let's let's find out how to make your energies more fluid. Let's. There's tons of stuff we can do. Yeah, people, great. And, and one of the problems, Paul, is people just don't even know that the help is available, right? Most systems just suffer and they, yeah. they they just dissolve and disintegrate and you need something that really intervenes that's why in a process work mandela would often say that the, one of the biggest things missing in the world today at every level is facilitation so you turned a situation it could have really driven both of them down which would have taken you down which would have hurt your abundance level which would have hurt your vision which you know, and you jumped in and started facilitating and you turned that around. Yeah, well, that's I'm a natural problem solver because I, I don't I don't want it's hard for me to be in a state of centered focus when either of my wives is not happy because they're part of me. So I can't breathe well if they can't breathe well. And well, wow. wow. you know, it's it's you know, we're, we're like a triangle. And if you bend the shape of any side of a triangle, it distorts the whole triangle. I think people often aren't aware that they're putting a lot more energy into maintaining the pain and the dysfunction than it would take to actually find a resolution and be creative about it. That's really, that's really right. That's Aikido. Aikido uses the least energy necessary to transform the situation. And so if we get really effective, we make those interventions. One of the toughest conflict work situations I was ever in was I was on an interview like this, a live interview in Poland on their national public radio. And they had a guy like, do you remember Michael and Justine Toms in the US, right? When they would do those. Michael Toms radio. Yeah. The, yeah, the, yeah, the, the radio show. Spiritual and psychological. So this was that kind of guy in Poland. And he's asking me all these questions about process work. And we're having a great time. And all of a sudden, he starts screaming at me. He says, Process work believes in deep democracy. Yes, that's right. And you believe that inside of every person is a little bit of every quality. That's right. 
So then he stands up and he starts screaming at me. So then are you like Hitler? Are you like Eichmann? And he starts screaming all this stuff. My poor translator broke out in a sweat and could no longer speak English. Wow. That's how intense the attack was. And so I said, well, just give me a minute. Give me a minute. And I said, so, okay, you're right. I am. I said, it's a little hard for me based on that my family, a lot, you know, a lot of, a lot of sides of my family died in this country during World War II in the Holocaust, but pick up those people. But I'll pick them up a little bit. I can pick them up a little bit. All right, do it. I said, well, I'm like them in that they had a message they wanted to spread throughout Europe. And I have a message. Well, what's your message? I said, my message is that what you said, Paul, that we all breathe together. I said, we're all one family. Mm -hmm. The well-being of one person is the well-being of every person. And we can never again do what was done during World War II. We need to join hands and understand how we're all connected. And he went like, Poof. and he said, end of interview. Thank you very much. And then he called the Process Work Institute the next day and he said, I was possessed by something. He said, I, I can't believe what I did to you guys and to Gary and that translator. Something possessed me. And I don't know why I attacked him like that. But the point of that conflict resolution was I went to the essence. And at the essence, we're all connected. We're all different, but we're all connected. And yeah. so you, you, you just reminded me of that lesson that when you find that in a family system, well, it's my well-being. No, it's my well-being. Wait a minute. That's true. But where are we all connected? And where is your well-being, my well-being, and my well-being, your well-being? If the world looked at each other like that, we would have a completely different world, right? Yes, totally. What are a few key methods we can use to avoid conflicts to begin with? And what are some of the most important first? Well, we, we talked about that. I think, have we covered that? Yeah, I think it's, it's those things we mentioned just because they're so important. Work on your trauma so you're not like a walking trigger. Work on the rank that you carry and how to carry that consciously and how to carry that with sensitivity and awareness, you know. You know, do your inner work. Do your inner work where that person's not just an X energy or you work with the kinds of X energy. Like if I'm about to teach, I have sage play out those X energies I imagine may come at me so that I'm dancing more fluidly with them. So there's a lot of things we can do to set up, not that we won't have conflict because it's part of nature, but that if we do, we can move in and out of that fluidly. Like Sage and I were talking about this as I was preparing and she said, do you remember when we used to fight like five hours? <laughs> I said, oh, I remember. And she said, what happened? You know, and we talked about how we, how we got out of that. And now if we fight five minutes, that can be a really long time. What were the steps that we took? Well, we trained, we worked. And one of the things that we did, we were talking about that's most important is to remember what our goals are as we're walking down the street or as we're approaching our partner. Like, is my goal just to blast you and to get that out? Okay if I'm conscious of that. But many times I do something like that. My, my goal is actually to get closer. And so that's a very helpful thing is if you can't remember it, ask your partner, what are you, what are you hoping for in the moment? You know, I do this also, like if I'm working with sides like around gender or race or economics or something, what would you like to do? Would you just like to get your feelings out? That's very important. Or are you actually hoping that the other side will hear you and that you'll make a difference? So the consciousness that you work, walk down the street with when you meet somebody or you walk into a corporation or a group, what is it that I'm hoping to accomplish in my going into conflict? Really important. The key word is walking with awareness. Yeah. I always tell people, be clear of what your dream is in the situation. So if, you, if you're right. starting to argue with your spouse or your, your boss, before you get too far, you need to ask yourself, what is my dream or what is it my what is it that I'm really hoping to achieve here? Because That's if you're not great. clear of that, you don't really know when you're being excessive, obsessive, or throwing shit into the fire that doesn't belong in there, dramatizing, you know, putting a, a North Star on your compass in a situation like that is very be important because if you don't, you know, as the old saying, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And when you start a conflict, 
every road just leads to more conflict until you can say, well, what is it? What is it that I'm wanting, feeling and needing? This is what my dream is. What are you wanting, feeling and needing? And what is your dream? And then we can work on that with clear heads and a clear sense of direction. Well, that was one of the most important statements. Clear heads, know what I need, know you know what you need. We put it together and then we work with clear heads. That's that's what we're shooting for. You know, I remember when I first got together with Sage and I came out of that background of being such a strong, like studying with uh, Gestalt right after Pearls died with some of his main trainers and whatever. And I was like, I was like a fireball. And so, and I remember Sage saying to me once, what are you trying to accomplish through this fighting? And I was saying, well, I'm doing my gestalt thing and I want to end up making love. And she looked at me like, she looked at me like, are you kidding? <laughs> and, I, and I had like the, the lights went off. I went, well, this isn't building intimacy. And so that was that, shift as I studied process work, process work is all about feedback. It's all about getting and noticing your own internal feedback and the feedback of your partner and not just believing your belief systems that something you're doing is going to work, right? Yes, exactly. What are some examples of how these methods have protected you or protected others or cities or countries from violence. I mean, there, have you had situations where people got mad enough at you as a facilitator they wanted to hurt you? I ha I've been physically attacked a number of times in my work. I've been attacked a number of times during group work or something like that physically. And it's one of the reasons why I say, if you really want to do this work, you don't have to study like, you know, don't you don't have to become like a, a master Shaolin karate, whatever, but know something about how to take care of your body. I mean, one of the last times it happened, a, a friend of mine who's a facilitator, we were in a group on working on consent. And I mentioned something about everybody must be fighting against somebody who's non-consensual and who just takes what they want around sexuality and whatever. And that it just triggered that person. And they just unleashed with me the most unbelievable series of punches. Wow. So at that moment, what stopped her was a lot of people started saying, the women were screaming, you're scaring us. You've got to stop. But I needed to know, what do you do if somebody's punching you? I don't, you know, so I physically did that. But let's go back to examples first with countries and then how it how the verbal stuff is protecting. me. One time, Sage and I were working in a small village in Israel, an Arab village. We were teaching and the mayor came out and said, you're leaving right now. And I said, well, I'm a little busy. I'm teaching a seminar. And the mayor <laughs> said, you know, I said, how about lunch? And the mayor said, you have to come right now. So I said to the seminar, well, I, I said, can they come with me? Mm. He said, yes. So we went to a protest tent and there was a protest going on about the Israeli government putting um, weapon systems in near an Arab school. And we processed that and processed that and processed that until there was a lot of resolution and until people decided what action they would take and they came together. And that mayor wrote me and he said that if we hadn't have stepped in, there would have been a, a major riot in that city. So that yeah, was an yeah. example of where we took all that heat and put it in the room. So in process work, the key principle is that what you can bring into the room doesn't have to happen on the streets. That's a really good example of something that happened in the world. And we've had situations like that many times. I've had somebody in the Israel-Palestinian work tell me that before they met us and heard this approach, that they were, they had decided they wanted to become a terrorist, a suicide bomber. And that by hearing that there were alternatives, that they no longer wanted to do that, that they wanted to study this kind of work, they wanted to do this kind of work. So I've seen it, I've seen it make an incredible difference. One other example is I was in London at a conference and I went out to lunch. And a lot of times when you know how to do this work, you don't just get to go to lunch. So I came back and I thought, well, it's a World War conference and I see a riot starting to happen. There's police with their batons and they're ready to hit these G7 protesters. There was the, the big seven countries were having a big economic conference coming up and, and the protesters were in front of the building and the police are going to beat them up. And so I said to the police, I notice you're hesitating. I don't think you really want to hit them. And then I said to the other side, you're calling them cuss words and pigs, and you're pushing them to hit you. And I don't think that's going to get you what you want now. 
Both sides, think about what you're doing. I'm kind of screaming this out into the air. The police put down their shields. The other side said, sorry. And everybody walks away. The captain of the police comes up to me. I thought he was going to arrest me. He said, do you have a business card? <laughs> That's great. He said, what did you just do? And I said, well, I facilitated on the street a potential violent scene where I saw both people escalating where they really didn't, neither side was really behind what they were doing. They were just caught. So that's two examples on the street. But I wanted to tell you what happened to me when I first learned this method and how it saved my life. Great. So I'm at home and I'm making dinner. I think I was trying to get ready to go to Aikido. So I'm kind of rushing. And the phone rings, as it often does. And I answer it. And the person says, hello, is this Gary Reese? Yeah. I'm coming to kill you. Oh, nice. I, I said, why? They said, you know what you did. So it was a case of mistaken identity. Somebody with my last name had beaten up their brother in a drug deal. Oh. So he said, I'm coming right now. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to leave. He said, you have no idea how close I am to your house. You can't get out. And I said, I'll protect myself. He said, not with the weapons we're bringing. And I said, I'll call the police. He said, I know exactly how far away the police are. You live out in the country, man. You're like a dead duck. So I thought, well, this looks pretty bad. Maybe I should try that new stuff I learned. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> since the weapon I had was like, I don't know what, I had like my little chopping axe in the house or something. They're coming with like AK-47s or whatever. Yeah. So I said, so I said, okay, wow, somebody beat your brother. I said, I'm a big brother. That's horrible. I'm on your side. Anybody ever hurt my brother? I'd want to hurt them. And I said, you got it, mister. And then I, so you also pick up the energy of the guy. And I said, all right, I'm coming. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm getting in the car. I'm driving to the sheriff's office. Would you recognize me if I was the guy that beat your brother up? He said, yeah. I said, I'll be standing on the sidewalk waiting for you. You better show up. And if it's me, you can have me. And if you try to hurt me, we go into the sheriff's office. He said, mister, you sound like you're a little crazy. <laughs> this is a homeopathic remedy you've created. <laughs> He said, you, 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 mister, I don't think I'm going to come. You better be there. So he says, mister, mister, he says, he says, I'm really sorry I disturbed your dinner, mister. He said, uh, he said, uh, and then we talked, then he says, I, I think I made a mistake. I said, well, I tried to tell you at the beginning you made a mistake. He said, well, <laughs> well anybody, you're, you're really going to show up. I'm on my way. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. So then we had a nice talk about brothers and being big brothers, and then he wished me a nice dinner. And so that was an example where, where I thought, well, this method is powerful. It really saved my life. I had to pick up not only his side, but his energy. That's a keto, right? Yes. You redirect the energy. And so those kind of things happen. I mean, Sage just said, you know, it's just part of the line that you walk on the earth that you, you know, so for example, I was, I was out running here in Hawaii a while back. I want to give more recent examples. I was out running here in Hawaii and I see this very wealthy, obvious couple. They have this incredible car and this beautiful dog and they're walking along the road and I see one of the local people coming, a Hawaiian person, and that dog almost jumps through the windows window of that car to attack the driver, the woman. The woman stops the car and she comes out with a knife. Ooh. And the guy says, you're going to use a knife on me, I'm going to kill you. So that was a moment where I facilitated, you know, I said, well, I'm out for a run. And I said to the woman, put the knife down. I'm going to work on this. You don't need the knife. I'll protect you. And I said to the man, you're not going to hurt her, but I'm, we're going to sit and hear what's going on here. And so I went on this side, that side, and at least then the couple started to walk away. And then I ran and walked with them for a while. We, we debriefed it. I went with her at first. And she said, you know, I've had a lot of trauma. I've been attacked a lot in my life, even by dogs. And I went and said to them, you know, she's had a lot of trauma and you didn't realize how that triggered her, that dog jumping through her window. And, you know, there's no reason to hurt her. She's just traumatized. And I said to the woman, you know, you certainly didn't want to use a knife because that's going to mess your life up. That was it. And I still see that woman when I'm running. She stops and talks to me all the time. Um, Great. She loves me. She always says, I love you. But, you know, so you've got to have those skills. It doesn't always work on the street like that. But it... Mm -hmm. uh, and one last story, I was at Aikido a couple weeks ago, and we we're training with sticks out in a park. And there's a guy there who had been drinking, and he comes over and he says, give me that stick. 
And I said, I can't give you the stick. And, and I heard his friend say, don't yelling, don't give him the stick. I can't give you the stick. I'm helping this class. I'm not teaching and I'm helping. And you're not part of the class. So I can't give you the stick. And so we go back and forth and back and forth. And I try doing my conflict work. The guy says, okay, man. Walks away. I said, that's okay, brother. I understand, you know. But, you know, it's just not, not the timing. Not the timing. And my teacher comes up to me and he said, I was standing next to you. I was going to pound the heck out of that guy, you know, if I needed to, you know. But what I'm saying, Paul, is that you never know when you're going to need to shift into that conflict work. And many, many times I've been able to prevent violence towards me or violence towards someone else. You have to be very careful. And we train. We'll, we'll do some advanced training for those interested on how to work on the street. That's a whole different art form. But, you know, um, one of my early teachers was Sun Bear when I was in my 20s. Native American medicine man, and I, I apprenticed with him. And Sunbury used to say, if your philosophy doesn't grow corn, I don't want to hear about it. And so that's what I say with this process work. If you, if you can't use it on the street, if you can't use it in your bedroom, if you can't use it in your business that's going downhill, then what good is it? It's got to work, right? It's got to yeah, work, yeah. right? It has to not only sound good, it has to work. Yes, very much so. How how do you think all of this conflict work has changed you inside? Well, for one thing, it's made me a lot more peaceful and gentle as a human being. One of the things is as you listen to people's conflicts and their suffering is it just opens, it's opened my heart more and more, making me more and more compassionate and understanding the amount of suffering in the world. Um, you know, I grew up sort of in a suburb and I had like a little narrow view of life and I've sat now with so many groups in so many countries and listened to their struggles to survive, to thrive, to. So it's really opened my mind and my heart to, um, to what is really happening in the world. I think that's one of the, the biggest things. And it's made me study and learn things that um, have helped me a lot. You start to get a sense that these are collective issues. They're not just your own little issue. And that helps you to not be so attached to your position, right? So yes. I, think, I think working on the world's issues has helped me become a lot more fluid of a person and a lot more connected um, to people. And the other thing is it's taught me is like I was sitting with somebody the other day and they were saying like the most polarized things they could politically to me. But I stayed connected to that person. I mm -hmm. like that person. We disagree on every aspect, you know, but I don't just fight with them. I stay connected. So, you know, I think conflict work has really taught me that. And the other thing it's really taught me is to think about what my goals are. Like when I came out as an early Gestalt therapist, I had this like, well, I have to like give you my feelings, you know. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, right. And now it's like, well, first of all, I have a lot more feelings than just this. And second mm -hmm. of all, second of all, what you said. You got to think about the dreaming. You got to think about what do you want to happen, and who who is the person you're with? What's the container you're relating to? So it's really woke me up about relationships to other people, to myself, to the world. Really transformed me. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. You know, I love my kids and I'm sure you love yours too. That's why I'm thrilled to announce that Organifi has just released their new kids line, Organifi Kids, with two initial offers to address the most common needs of children today, Easy Greens and Protect. I can't tell you how important these products are considering that most children today are not getting enough greens to meet their nutritional needs, not to mention the fact that our children literally are our future. I recently watched an interview with Zen Honeycutt, founder of Moms Across America. She and a panel of experts exposed the fact that most kids' school lunch programs contracted out to fast food corporations, and if that's not bad enough, she ran lab tests on a significant number of kids' school lunches and found that not only was the food very devitalized, but that it was absolutely loaded with high levels of many dangerous pesticides, including glyphosate. As I show in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, most of these pesticides not only disrupt normal hormonal function, they can also cause abnormal growth and development and are commonly linked to cancer, and we have the highest rates of cancer in children in history right now. 
Organifi's Easy Greens and Protect for Kids are made with organic ingredients and custom formulated for kids two and older. Additionally, these excellent much needed products are formulated for daily use. The main benefits of the new Kids Easy Greens includes daily superfood greens and gives your child optimal nutritional diversity and the everyday nutrition in Kids Easy Greens fills common nutritional gaps. Kids Easy Greens is also formulated to support digestive health, which many children need today. The main ingredients in Organifi Kids Easy Greens are nutrient-rich veggies, including carrot, broccoli, sprouts, spinach, and beet, superfoods moringa, and chlorella. Digestive support includes digestive enzymes, probiotics, and fiber. Additionally, Organifi's new Protect for Kids offers fast-acting immune support formulated for kids that is gentle enough for daily use. So with Organifi Protect for Kids, you can rest assured their immune system is always being supported. The main ingredients that Protect offers for your kids are orange and acerola cherry, powerful sources of vitamin C and antioxidants, astragalus, a potent adaptogenic root used to support and boost the immune system, elderberry, an antioxidant plant new nutrient that supports the body's defenses against illness. Propolis, the bodyguard of the beehive, can help naturally prevent sickness and naturally modulate the immune system. These excellent kids' products not only taste fantastic and are low in sugar, they're very easy to use. Just add them to a glass of water or your favorite juice and stir. To get your kids' The nutrition and immune support they need and deserve, go to Organifi.com forward slash C-H-E-K-20. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash C-H-E-K-20. And on checkout, use the promo code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K-20 for 20% off. It gives me great joy knowing I can help you find excellent organic nutrition and immune support for your children so they can be as healthy as my kids are. I know you know this, but you know, when you look at what the spiritual path is, regardless of Buddhism, yoga, any of the world religions, really spiritual development is ultimately about learning how to resolve conflicts in ways that lead to more connection, more right. understanding, more empathy, more compassion, and, and a greater capacity to love. It, it seems to me that we have all these spiritual paths, but very little of them have anything about conflict resolution in them. You know, they might say, do your shadow work or call on this God to support you or things like that. But those, those things really don't have much purchase power when you're in the middle of an intense argument with your spouse or you're, you're pissed off at your boss or you feel disrespected. So it seems like for those that want more tools in their spiritual development toolbox, no matter what branch they're coming from, because you know I don't know of any of them that really teach any kind of systematic approach to conflict resolution. And I think it leads to a lot of spiritual bypassing. It leads to a lot of um, rank and power plays. I, I don't, that's not my issue. That's yours or, or you, you, you wouldn't think that way if you were more evolved or, you know, you know, all this kind of stuff. So it seems to, it, it seems to me that this course of yours could be a legitimate path that could be, a spiritual path all by itself, but it could also be a great tool in the toolbox for spiritual development for anybody. Boy, you couldn't have said it better. First of all, this awareness is needed. Like I've worked with many spiritual communities with even teachers that I went to when I was young, famous spiritual leaders, where their lack of awareness around rank and power <laughs> did a lot yeah. of damage a lot of damage to those movements. And I've tried to help a lot of those groups regroup and heal that lack of awareness sometimes where their teacher had enormous power, but in other areas was really unconscious and abusive. I'm with you. Like, I think it's much easier. It, the, I think a really important beginning ground is meditate in a cave or meditate in your ashram or in your, in your meditation room. But can you meditate in the midst of hot conflict? Exactly. That's hot. That's advanced work. And that's spiritual work. And for me, 
the commitment to take the other side, that's a moment of spiritual transformation, right? The willingness to get out of your own righteousness and your own ego and open up. That takes a lot of spiritual power. That's why I say you can't just say, here's the three steps, the four steps. To do that takes a lot of spiritual longing and openness. And so I really do think it's a spiritual path. I mean, I know one person who, who did that to some degree was Thich Nhat Hanh. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh used to say, Thich Nhat Hanh once wrote that when he was in uh, um, being bombed in Vietnam, that he was meditating on how he was the one being bombed and he was the bomber simultaneously. And I think Thich Nhat Hanh had, had stipulated some steps for how to work on conflict and community. So I know that that there were spiritual teachers who did it, but many spiritual traditions are against conflict. Yes. They just say it's bad, try to repress it. Um, it just doesn't work. And, and then you see all kinds of crazy stuff happen. So I think it's a spiritual path. It's a grounded, it, for me, it's grounded spirituality. Like, can I walk my talk? Right? Can I yeah. really, really carry that spirituality? That I, can I create... What did they say about become become the world you want to create something like yes, that? Yes, yeah, right. I think it it take what I, I I have a term I I use that's spiritual courage. I think it takes spiritual courage to really put yourself in someone else's shoes, switch roles, like you said. Yep. You know. And and real shadow work takes a lot of spiritual courage. Like I, I've what? I've had to I've had to to go through some struggles since COVID started to to find Bill Gates inside of me. You know, I, I've That's had to right. find Donald Trump inside of me. I've had That's to find right. a lot of these people inside of me, and it's it's an uncomfortable thing to do. It's really uh, uncomfortable. You know, part of me doesn't want to look. I don't even want to pretend that they're there because it makes it easier for me to objectify them. And, right. and, and it also, it's easy to, you know, I'm an ex paratrooper. So it's easy for me to think like a soldier and say, well, we just got to eliminate this problem. But if we don't do have the courage to find these qualities in ourselves uh, and we eliminate them on the outside, we, we don't realize we keep projecting this into the culture. So it's like you cut right. once the snake off, it's like a hydra. You cut one head off and there's another one at you before you can even <laughs> put your sword down. That's how to say it. And I love uh, that word. If I can use that word, if I can borrow that word, spiritual courage. I love that word. It it it, it really talks about what what it takes and what it takes to sit in the fire. I mean, yeah. um, you know, a lot of times now, like I'm in Hawaii, so I go and I meditate on this beach, and I say to the universe, "That's it for me, baby. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to meditate, and then I'm going to snorkel, and then I'm going to meditate, and then I'm going to snorkel." And so I'll meditate. And then the universe says, go to Rwanda. Huh? <laughs> I, I thought I'm like, come on. I thought I'm retired and meditating and snorkeling. Go ahead and meditate and snorkel. Get a lot of that in. But in the next years, I really want you to do something about the trauma in R Rwanda. So, uh -huh. so that, takes, that takes listening and it takes the courage to be your whole self, right? Not to yeah. put us down. And if you can be your whole self, then you support the whole self and everybody else and in the world. And like you said, that when you have to find the worst people inside of you, that takes spiritual courage. It does. But that's how you that's how you transform it. Yeah, and you can also begin at that point to have empathy for them. You know, one of the things I did, for example, is I studied the life of Bill Gates very carefully, and I found that, you know, that's right. His childhood was really a setup for who he became. And, and you know, that those stages of our development are largely unconscious. For example, <laughs> I listened to a great book called Control, Control Oligarchs by Seamus Brun Bruner, which is a very thorough expose of the key people that are, you know, moving all the pieces around and right. uh, causing all the things. And in, in, in the book, he said, Bill Gates' favorite game as a child was Monopoly. And I went, there it was. There was his dream. Right. There's this childhood dream. That's it. That's it. If you can really feel into those people and see how damaged they are, then you also know more how to maybe work with them. I remember two of the guys politically, I won't mention names, but they were the most irritating. I mean, I read about their childhood 
And they said that their dad used to have them hit each other with metal pipes, the brothers. So is it any wonder that they turned to be such brutal people in terms of the way they address the earth and things like that? So, yeah, you could just close your eyes to all that or you can do the work and then you understand from the inside also how to work with people like that. Um, so we need people willing to walk that spiritual path and make that change. And, you know, in many spiritual traditions, there was always that split. Like there were the meditators and there were the world changers. But I last time I heard the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama said, last time I saw you all in this city, I told you all to meditate. He said, we're beyond that. It's time to get off the cushion, meditate, and now get out in the world and make a change. And so yeah. putting those things together, world inner work and world change, that's what's different. Um, you know, Jung, Jung mostly talked about world change as inner work. The inner alchemy, very important. But where Mendel went the next step around sitting in the fire was, yes, sit in the inside and then train enough that you have the skills to go sit on the outside, sit right in the middle of the world's conflicts. And what I've added to that is sit in the middle with a cool head. That's the second training. You have to have enough positive detachment that you don't just lose it in the middle of those situations, but you can hold that. When I was a soldier, we were repeatedly trained through many interesting experiences. Never lose your military bearing. If the yes. guy standing next to you gets his head blown off and you start crying and losing composure, you're going to be the next one dead and you might shoot someone standing next to you without realizing what you're doing. So I've, I've always had that training in me, you know, when, when, like, you know, I've had, I've had healing ceremonies where all of a sudden people with possessions went off and started, the possessions started coming out and scaring the shit out of people. Yes. And I had to, you know, just hold my center and that's you it. Know, I, I, I learned to just, I found with those entities, if you show fear, it it makes them even more nasty. Yeah, they get hungry, yeah. So I just immediately began talking to them and, and befriending them, say, oh, well, it's nice to see you. What What is it? Are you hungry or what can, <laughs> what can I help you with? What are you really looking for? You know, and it, Unbelievable. And it, it really shocks even the entity because they're expecting a, a, a reaction. But you know, being a soldier and being a paratrooper, it helped give me that ability when things get hot, you just got to kind of slow down a little bit. It's kind of counterintuitive because you think you got to go faster, but if you aren't careful, you're acting out of fear reaction and you're not thinking anymore. You're not processing. So you just become an unconscious leaf blowing in the wind, which means that you could end yourself and others. It's so brilliant the way, the way you say that, that, um, you know, and I remember the first time I had a group come at me and I took the other side and I thought that's not going to work. And then it did. And I remember the first time I went soft in Aikido when somebody attacked me and I thought I had to be tough. And so the way you learned that, it, when you told that story, it reminded me where I saw world work really change in the early days, you know, the person who was the corporate, whatever, the Bill Gates, the racist, the whatever person was like, whatever we were against, we would just encourage and we would all join in smashing and had a good time as facilitators looking great and all that. But, you know, it wasn't very successful in terms of people coming back and we weren't as effective in change. And so I remember, I remember Arnie Mandel walking over to one of those kind of racist, difficult, impossible, hateful figures. And he said to him, I think you need soup. <laughs> <laughs> and that for me was the change of world work and the guy said what do you mean soup and arnie said i think you're really hungry for something and your hatred is an expression of that and the guy opened up about his own trauma and his own abuse and and that for me is what you're saying is you've got to keep your head and even with entities or with really horrible peoples or people not horrible people but people saying horrible things there's a human being in there can you move them because if you just feed them some more rage and all whatever, that may not work. That may just feed them. But can you find them? Can you connect? Can you move them? It's um, It takes a lot of training. That's why I call it becoming a black belt in this art. Because, you know, like if I'm working with a conflict, I don't know, between me and Sage over where we should go for dinner. I mean, I can do that. Anybody can do that. 
but you want to work with stuff on the street or you want to work with really tough issues in organizations or corporations or or between countries, you've got to train and you've got to have those kind of skills. And everything is your training, like your paratrooper training taught you some amazing conflict work skills, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we've been going for quite a while. And, and so I'd like to kind of wrap it up with uh, an overview of your program. And uh, you know, let, what, what are people going to learn by investing the time and the energy to engage this program? I think we've had a, we've, I mean, you've given us a lot of really great examples of how you use this. I don't think there's any question that there's real skills to be gained and that you can teach them. So maybe just a structure of, you know, what what can the incoming student expect to be taught? Yeah. So, you know, we've got I've got 19 different videos that go over all of these steps. Then there's all kinds of handouts and course material. And then we'll work together for a year once a week to practice all these exercises, to practice all these different skills. So we'll go through all the skills, like how do you assess a conflict? How do you facilitate communication? How do you facilitate two-party conflict? How do you facilitate group conflict for organizations, for nonprofits, for corporations, between countries? Then we'll go through rank and power training and how to do that. And I've really changed and added a lot to the rank and power training I had because I didn't find it as effective as I wanted. So I have a lot of tools around sensitivity, around equality building, around things that I personally bring to that work. And then we'll go in and we'll study how to work with all those different tools, the five-minute open forum that I find so effective, especially with corporate work. We'll train in how to run open forums. We'll train in how to run group process. Even if you do little things in group process, like you're in a corporate setting and you just call out a hot moment and you ask the group to stop and focus on that, that changes things. We teach people what I call participant facilitation. That means I'm not the identified facilitator. But I can facilitate in any group I'm in. I'm in a board meeting. I'm in a school meeting. I mean, when my kid was in Waldorf, I unofficially facilitated. And then I was formally invited in to facilitate a whole bunch of stress in the community. And I've done a bunch with Waldorf schools. You know, so but I also did a lot of participant facilitator before I was identified as a facilitator. I'm facilitating from the background. We're going to teach people how then to work with vision. How do you create visionary work, especially vision work in the corporate setting and in business? And what does deep visioning have to do with abundance, success, lower worker turnover, lower health problems and absenteeism in your workers? So we're going to really teach a lot about visioning and writing and reviewing vision statements. We're going to talk about how to make action plans, how to implement them and how to follow up on it. So everything you and I have talked about, Paul, we're going to train it. That's good. I I like the fact that it's a a year because that's time enough to really get your support and and learn. And it's not like you're just doing an online course where you're kind of all by yourself. You can actually ask questions. So you, you say you're meeting every week or how does that run? Yeah, we'll meet for two hours every week. So you can come in and say like also... We do a lot in not a lot of the examples I gave were in world work, but I work with like corporations, like I've worked with the biggest kinds of accounting firms. I've worked with one of the biggest producers of rice in the world. I've worked with some large construction companies. I've worked with all kinds of for profit corporate kinds of situations. I I coach people who work with a lot of the biggest corporations in Japan. I teach that. I coach many of the coaches over there. And I coach many of the coaches in the U.S. who work with on the East Coast, working with many of the really big corporations. So this stuff works. And it's not just like, and we adapt it to that situation. I'm not going to do on the street what I'm going to do in a corporate board meeting. We make it fit. But So you can come to those classes and you can say, this is what's going on in my nonprofit, or this is what's going on in my corporation. And then also I give everybody at least one free um, coaching session and some reduced price coaching sessions where I can really help them with their specific conflicts they're struggling with. But if, if people wanted to invest in one thing that could do a lot of different things for their health, their relationship, their abundance, their success, their happiness, their, you know, work on becoming more of a master in how to dance with conflict. 
Yeah, exactly. It's a that's a, there. There's that takes spiritual courage just to engage the practice, you know, because fear tends to, you know, make cowards out of people, or it makes them very aggressive. One of the two. It, I think <laughs> one of the two. One yeah. of the two. Dancing is the beautiful balance of of the middle, right? It's the middle. I'm I'm not acting like I don't have power. I have power, but I have sensitivity. And I have awareness and I have openness to who I'm dancing with. And I find that place of harmony with my partner where it, the universe, is dancing us together, right? We're finding our dance, whether yeah. that's with two people or with a school or with a corporation. We're getting back to what is dream what is the dreaming here? Like the vision I have of most organizations or of all organizations or systems is there's like a well of pure energy that feeds that system. How do we get back to being in connection and being fed by that pure system? Without it, we burn out, we burn up. But yeah, when you're connected right. to it, you're connected to something infinite. And that's why this is a spiritual path, right? Yeah, it's beautiful. What's the investment for the year of training? What do people invest in that? The cost for all of the programs is twenty nine ninety five, except in Eastern Europe, countries it's in other countries it's half of that but then we're giving people off like if they sign up early they can get five hundred dollars off of that 29.95 or they can get 250 off of the eastern european rate so when you really think about it how much you get how many trainings how many videos it's it's a really really good way to go and so for my podcast listeners, they get a $500 discount. Is there a certain date they have to sign up by to get that discount or is that an open discount? No, I think I just checked with the team that's working with me and I think they have about a month to get that. But I would, I would jump in, Paul, because w this is going in front of so many thousands of people through this and through some of the radio shows I'm doing and this and that. I want them, if they really feel called to this, I would go ahead and fill out that um, that form you get on my website um, that I think you're going to give them and get their get their self on that waiting list and I can talk to them and we can go further. We want to get them signed in because I think we're going to have, I mean, I just announced it to a few people last night and already the people are just pouring in. So what's the website to go to so they can get, the, is it pretty obvious on the website where to go for the, for the sign up form? Yes, yes. I think I think Penny's gonna also somehow has got all that the the formal link. But I go to www.conflictworkmethod, not methods, method. dot com, and it has a whole thing there that talks about what you're gonna get, and it has you sign up for a wait list, and then you'll get a call from me, and then if you want to go further, we sign we send you the way to pay for it, and you can pay for it all at once. You can pay for it. In two payments, or you can make monthly payments. So we're going to work with people so that they can get this training. Perfect. So for you guys that are interested, look in the show notes. Penny will have put a link to Gary's website and everything else there. Your Living 4D discount. You know, I don't see these things as costs. I see them as investments. Gasoline costs you money. Clothes cost you money. But life-changing education is an investment you know, can, can really pay back a million times over, even if it's not in money, if it's in happiness. When you look at all the money people spend on dealing with pain of broken relationships and everything related to it, that's an expense. <laughs> well, when you said that, it touched me so much. The hair stood up on my arms. It gave me chills. There's something really deep you're saying there. Those of us who are on a spiritual path, we know that to help ourselves and our loved ones in the world, we have to invest in it. We have to invest. We have to invest in learning. It's an investment, but it's the real investment. It's the real, it's the real thing that, that helps us move forward. Well, my, my personal investment strategy has always been to invest in myself because the more I have to share, the more I feel good about being who I am, but also the more opportunities I have to not only share with people, but make a good living because I have something to share, you know? Right. A mechanic with no tools isn't that helpful. <laughs>
Well, I want to thank you also. I want to thank you for this and for what I know you've done for so many people and for people that you and I are both really connected with. Yeah. That you've been a big factor in their lives and will continue to be. It's great to be on the planet with you and to team up. I'll just close by saying, I hope you guys enjoyed this. And uh, thank you to my sponsors for your amazing products and all the great work you do to make the soil healthier and support organic and biodynamic farmers and free range regenerative agriculture and uh, for providing us such amazing foods and products for our families, for ourselves, for our kids and for our future. And thanks for anything you guys buy from the sponsors a little bit supports the podcast. And I'm super excited to, to, uh, know that you guys could pick up some of the things we talked about today and just start with what Gary shared with us today and go test ride, you know, just some of the very simple things of just pausing and paying attention and being brave enough to put yourself in the other person's shoes and get clear on what it is that your dream is for the situation and share your wants, feelings, and needs and give the other person a chance uh, I think just those little tools, if you can imagine what can happen using those, imagine what will happen with a year of training with Gary. And, uh, you know, your whole life could change. And so could all of our lives because you might be the next great teacher out there and you don't know it yet. And Gary can uh, unveil you. That's right. And, you know, you mentioned the earth, Paul, and I just wanted to say I didn't mention that. But one of the things we talk about a lot is how war is one of the main factors behind global warming. So if we yes. can, if we, <laughs> but, if we can, true, <laughs> right? If we can help stop war, those of us that are want to make a difference for our children and grandchildren around climate change, we're not just doing our own fixing our relationships, but this is also a way of giving back and protecting the earth is to transform conflict. Absolutely. Not only is it, uh, you know, a, a thermodynamic event, it's extremely toxic to the planet. I mean, I'm an ex-soldier and my job was to repair weapon systems on Cobra helicopters. I know something about munitions and, and these things are damn toxic. A lot of soldiers yeah. get sick just from being exposed to all the munitions. That's and, right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we, we've... But create you know, an alternative to war. Let's work yeah. together. Whether it's in our relationship, in our body, or between countries, let's together join and create an alternative to that kind of war and its destruction. Let's create something based on understanding, communication, awareness, and love. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Gary. And give my love to Sage and thank you to oh, all of you. You too. Paul. Guys out there, let's do this together. It's uh, all hands on deck right now. I don't think I need to tell you that. We got to each do our little part. And the best way to do your part is Take a few minutes each day to really love and nurture yourself and be your own best friend. And that way you're never alone in the world and you can go out there and share that love with everybody else. And we're right on, on track. So I'll have something amazing for you in a week. Lots of love. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Paul. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Aho. Aho. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Gary Reese. You can find Gary online at conflictresolutionmethod.com or on Facebook at gary.reese. That's G-A-R-Y dot R-E-I-S-S. -S. Gary's course, 12 Steps of Conflict Resolution, is now open for registration and listeners can save $500 by mentioning Living 4D with Paul Check. Visit Gary's website at conflictresolutionmethod.com for more details and to sign up. Catch up with Paul on Instagram, TikTok, and threads at paul.check, on X at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Again, a big thank you to our premier sponsors by Optimizers, Paleo Valley, and Organifi. We could not produce this podcast without their support. And of course, Paul only works with companies whose products he loves. All the sponsors offer special discounts for our listeners. So please visit the show notes page at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast to get the links and the details. And finally, if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review on the podcast platform of your choice. 
This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, and YouTube.